and call this meeting to order. Let's see if everybody's here. Um, Andrew, you here? Here. David, are you here? Here. Uh, Sunita, are you here? I'm here. Are you here? Was that me or was it Howard? Oh, I'm sorry, Howard. Are you here? I'm sorry, Howard. I'm present. Yes, Roar. Uh, I'm here. Thank you. Dick? Yes. Uh, Franco? Here. And Dave? Here. All right, hang on a second, guys. Let me get speed. Uh, let's see here. Uh, orders of the day. Let's see. Um, a gentle reminder to stick around after the meeting. Uh, general reminder: We have great Zoom etiquette. It's probably the best Zoom etiquette board I'm on. I'm on plenty. Um, go ahead and interrupt the speaker uh, or anybody if it's topical to question, but. In general, for important matters, we'll go round robin. You guys will know. You guys, the etiquette is somewhat intuitive. Um, let me make sure. All right. Um, remember, remember the AB thing. Um, I feel like I'm watching a murder mystery. Um, so at the end of last meeting, we were a little concerned about the reappointment um, of our uh, some members. We had, I think, four up. Um, I just got an email from uh, Ruto yesterday, the day before, that city council has done its duty. Um, so all four uh, have are officially back on the board, so we're not to exercise the little known law that if we don't fill one of your slots, you stick on. And I'd like to personally thank all of you for um, reading up. Uh, 20, as you know from my unusual stand, taking an extra year as chairman, 2023, I think will be the year that we finally enact something that our board started as i've pointed out many times in february of 2012 a few months after uh we independence first came on this board so thank you all for your generous contribution to the stability of that um i think a showing of our knowledge and strength to the city council will allow us to put our incentive compensation system in plan in place and that's the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle that Vince challenged us all with um, back in 2012. Uh, let's see. Um, any public comments? Anybody out there want to jump in right at the beginning? Uh, if not, uh, we have the consent calendar. Anybody want to pull anything off the consent calendar? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve it. So move, Santos. I got to watch my Santos. Do I have a second? Second, Gardner. Second. I've got, my, I've got a motion by Santos. Second by Gardner. Let's go around real quick. How do you vote, Andrew? Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Eshvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave Wilson. Aye. Uh, Chair Lanza, I vote aye as well. So that makes it unanimous. God, if I could chat here by lunch, everybody owes me a beer. Um, two, over to you, Prabhu, uh, for investments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, trustees. Um, we are going to talk about last quarter's investment performance. And for that, I will soon be turning this over to Casey at, of Newberger Berman and later on to Laura and Jared. Uh, but before I do that, as always, I have um, performed my investment numbers. These are, of course, unaudited, and they come from Makeda. Uh, as of November 29th, it's two days ago, 2.09% uh, fiscal year to date. Healthcare trust was down 1.41%. This, of course, does not include yesterday's monster rally, which I reckon added about 2% uh, to our planned returns. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, unless there are any questions for me, I'm going to invite uh, Casey Boyer from Newburger Berman. Drop, Casey. Okay, great. Thank you again for having me. Let me share my screen quickly. Uh, 
Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, today, I will be going through the Q2 report for your program. Um, I'm very happy to, to do this each quarter so we can kind of go through what changes are happening. Um, just overall in the market, um, Q2 valuations, private equity valuations did go down. Um, and I would say I'll, I'll give a little bit of commentary on Q3 as well, um, since we are getting information in for that and, and have kind of an early read on what Q3 will look like. Um, but for Q2 specifically, the, the valuations and, and program level performance went down about right around 4%, a little bit under 4%. So you will see that reflected here in the materials. Um, for the net multiple, we do um, have a 1.8 times return. Uh, more specifically, that's 1.82 times. Um, in Q1, that was 1.8 eight, nine times. So you can kind of see how that went down a little bit um, with an, a net IRR of 29.4% 20, for the new burger program specifically. Um, you'll also see here on page two, the legacy investments and how those two are combined for your total private equity exposure on the far right. During Q2, Q1 and Q2 were actually quite good quarters for returns of capital. So during Q2, there was about 10 million of distributions returned to the program. So you'll see the net return uh, distributions of 44.2 last quarter, that was right around 34 million. So we did have some nice distributions from underlying co-investments that we were able to return back. Um, I will say for Q3, still early, we don't have all valuations in from our, from our platform, but Q3 looks like it will be somewhat similar to Q2 in terms of return valuations being a little bit down. Um, we, we expected that, uh, things, things are still a little bit, um, undetermined on, on how the, um, overall market will, will, um, kind of turn out over the next Q1, Q4, Q1. Um, so in the buyout arena, valuations were down in Q3 about 2%, a little over 2% in, and in venture, returns were down about 8%. Again, you would expect that type of uh, difference between buyout and, and venture as venture companies are a little bit smaller and um, mostly not profitable companies. Um, those two metrics, account for about 70% of our platform. So 70% have reported to us. Those numbers could change as we receive more information in, but we found that around 70% of, of valuations, it won't change a lot. So we kind of expect those um, numbers for Q3. I would say the majority of valuations that we've received specifically from buyout, there was a range of returns. Um, they were either down 5% or kind of up 5%. So that's a lot of returns were in, in that range of, of um, information for Q3. So if we turn to page three, page three, four, five, six, and seven, we're, we're starting to get even more investments. So the pages are becoming longer. 
are all benchmark information for your underlying investments, which includes both the legacy and the new burger. Um, you'll see how the, the performance for each investment is on the far right. Um, and then you'll see also the core tiling information. So you can see not only if your first, second, third core tile for a specific investment, but where it falls in the range of being a first quartile or second quartile fund. Um, some of these uh, metrics are it's second time, it's a it's a second quartile fund, but it's actually very close to that first quartile. So it, it gives you a little bit more information. Um, so pages three, four um, are the legacy information. A lot of those. Uh, fund investments are older, so um, some of the metrics don't move a lot. Moving on to pages five, six, and seven, you'll see new burger investments. Again, there's a lot of more recent vintages, so you do see a little bit more volatility um, just in terms of they're still calling capital. A lot of them have a lot more investments to make and are still kind of um, putting those into companies as they, as they find them over time. We don't quartile 2021 and 2022. That's a little bit too early. You'll see a lot of those um, investments haven't called hardly any capital, so it, it does not make a lot of sense to show that information just yet. These um, up and down arrows show what the difference was between last quarter. So obviously an, a green up means that quartile went up for the quarter um, and the red meaning it went down. Page eight gives a little bit more information around the difference between committed capital, meaning the investments we've committed to, and the difference of which of those investments have actually called the capital and put the capital to work. So you'll notice um, specifically the differences between co-investments and primaries, co-investments being called directly and going into companies immediately, primaries investing capital over two to three years. Um, you'll see the, this information by geography um, as well as vintage year. So as you'll see kind of here, invested capital of both the Newberger and Legacy program gives you a good idea and should provide some comfort on the level of diversification that, you, that your program has by vintage year. So starting in 2005 and now a consistent investment period starting in you know, 2017 um, uh, in, in, in each year since then. Uh, page nine, this is information um, on the Newberger program specifically. So at the top you'll see the returns by investment type, primaries, secondaries, and co-investments. Um, these returns uh, continue to develop. Primaries obviously um, are performing very well. We're still actively making primary investments. So this is also including, all of these actually are including investments that you know we just made a month ago, we just made a year ago. Um, so all of these performance metrics, I would say for secondaries and co-investments, really great DPI performance where we're seeing on the secondaries um, actually more than have returned cost. Co-investments right at kind of that 50% mark where we've returned 50% of the invested capital. Um, and all of these still developing and, and uh, all of them really uh, generating that return. And then at the bottom, you'll see how the entire program is benchmarking. 
um, the net performance for the program at 1.82 times net TVPI, net IRR at 29%. Um, that does benchmark at a second quartile. Um, and so you'll see more specifically how that looks. So net IRR just missing that first quartile by, you know, 0.5%. And then the net TVPI is basically in the middle there between the first and second quartile. Um, so still positive. We expect a lot of um, the investments that we've made in the last couple of years um, to continue to develop and, and hopefully um, get that up into the first quartile. We're still very happy with these returns, but um, obviously would, would love to be first. So um, I, I think I'll just open it up for questions if anyone has any, any specifics. Go ahead and jump in, folks. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, you go ahead, Sunita. You go first. Okay. Uh, I guess a couple of questions. The um, uh, you said that uh, is the landscape such that you is the expectation perhaps uh, that there will be more secondary opportunities, given uh, you know given given that there may be people trying to exit and raise liquidity uh, from their investments. Yeah. So we have seen an uptick in secondary transactions. Um, there's definitely more of the traditional secondaries, which is what you're talking about, where people kind of need to rebalance their portfolio um, or they need more liquidity. We've seen an, an uptick of those. The last few years, second the secondary market has been very much led by GP led secondaries where the GPs are actually kind of taking some assets in their portfolio and, and doing a secondary on one two, or two assets. Um, those are very still a very strong part of the secondary market, um, which does kind of help the GPs on their on their funds and, and getting some returns back. Um, but yes, we have seen definitely higher deal flow in the secondary market, and I would expect that would continue as the unknown continues. And, and are we well positioned, Prabhu, or somebody on your team to take advantage of that? From our perspective, yes. Um, we have a, a full secondary team on our side. And the way we've set up your portfolio is the secondary and co-investment allocation is really one bucket that we can use to invest where the best investments are in that market. We don't have a set allocation of we have to invest this much into co-investments and this much into secondaries. We take advantage of opportunistic investments as they come through. So from our side, Yes, we have capital to invest in secondaries and, and we are very active in the secondary market with a full full secondary team. So um, from our perspective, yes. Yeah, hi, Casey, this is Howard. Thank you for the presentation. Actually, just to follow Sunia's question, uh, are the secondaries that your team does, are they mostly secondary interests or GP led? types of transactions or, or are they directs? Um, it, it's it's a lot of all of that. Um, so I would say our secondary team, their bread and butter is really more of a mid-market secondary team. So they're kind of not going after all of that really large cap market, which Actually, in the last few years, a lot of the market has been more GP led. So they're very active on, on the GP led and within the secondary market. Our whole platform really plays to um, great secondary deal flow. We're 
big primary fund investors. We co-invest with these GPs. So we have a lot of touch points um, across many aspects. Okay, great. And I, I, I do, I do like the uh, the arrows. That was that was very helpful to see. Um, there was uh, so on this slide in particular. Uh, is this since there are no arrows here on the IRR and TVPI? Yeah. Uh, that means it it was the same the last quarter. So, no, actually, I we should add arrows here. Um, the IRR last quarter was first quartile. So it did change. The IRR, as you can see, slipped just below into the second quartile range. Okay. And that was uh, probably as a result of what you, meant, you mentioned with private equity and evaluations uh, trending downwards. That was... I yeah, that so was for, yeah, so for Q2, um, you know, as I mentioned, the o overall performance of your portfolio did go down slightly. Um, you know, we are very active in making new investments. So those new investments going in at, at one times also does affect that IRR. Um, and, you know, I, I will say benchmarking definitely is somewhat of a black box where we don't know exactly the what is in the benchmark and and kind of how those investments are being affected by the same market dynamic so um you know when we benchmark we we benchmark against the best peer we can find and and um don't have a lot of specifics into what types of investments um and how that differs from your specific portfolio of investments. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. All right, this hey, is just one more thing to add. Uh, apologies. Yeah, uh, but one thing with the benchmarking, as Casey mentioned, is our program is now in year six. So this is a 2017 vintage that we're comparing against. And typically funded funds only have an investment period around three years, maybe four years. So as Casey pointed out, there's more investments that we're being that we are making at cost. So that tends to drag down both the IRR and net multiple. So we are looking at other ways of breaking this up. So maybe making it into two different tranches. So every three years, showing a different vintage and fund of funds to compare against. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah, thanks, Dinesh. So let me jump in. This is gonna be a question for Prabhu and you guys know me, I'm kind of long-winded, but I think my long-windedness here is gonna be productive. So I launched this meeting by thanking um, trustees for sticking around because we had a heavy lift to do next year following up on a 10-year plan. So the essence of the plan that Vince put in place and the, the Joint Personnel Committee is now working so hard on is this disconnect between the actuary saying you have to be more conservative than your peers, and we all know why I'm not going to go into that, right? But at the same time, the market doesn't recognize that. And they say, well, you guys are only six and five eighths and CalPERS is seven and you suck. So Vince's thesis was, look, we do have to be less risky. That's big public markets. That's beta. That's where the bulk of our return comes from. And we have to have a lower beta, right, than our peer uh, pension funds, but as Vince pointed out, we can generate alpha to cover that gap. Prabhu would tell you right now, and, and I've seen the numbers, that we've been consistently generated, generating profitable alpha since he came enough to cover the gap. And so the thesis is, and we may not be able to do this, that we can maintain a core portfolio, lowering risk on our peers, a portfolio that's returning six and five eighths, we can do things like this in order to return seven. So one of those rare times in life, guys, when Vince's thesis was, it appears to be true, we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have our cake. We can have an inherently lower risk plan. We can eat it too. We can have a discount rate that matches our peers, and we can deliver to that return. Now, that goes the final – there was a question buried in here somewhere – 
<laughs> that goes to what Howard just said. Look, I'm in the industry. I know what Howard just asked. And I know Casey just answered. But to the rest of you, man, that's inside baseball. Well, that's where alpha gets generated. So the question to you, Prabhu, is of that three, uh, 30, 40 basis points of consistently profitable alpha, and you can see it here. Look at this IRR. My God, we switched six to five eights. Good Lord, we're doing double double digits. We're starting with twos and threes. Prabhu, how much of that consistent profitable alpha is coming from this sort of category of investments and feel free to opine for some time on that answer. Yeah, no, thank you, Drew. That's a great question. So by definition, the way we've calculated alpha so far has excluded private markets, right? And so we include private market returns in the aggregate return, but we neutralize it when it comes to alpha simply because of what Casey just said and what Dinesh added. It's the benchmarking of private markets is very difficult, but it can be done. So I'm gonna give you some numbers here. So just everyone knows, just looking at the public markets and Laura will share this later. Uh, you look at that September 30th, right? Looking at the report that Makita presented, our alpha just from public markets has been 50 basis points. Over the last three years, 90 basis points. Over the last year, it's been 110 basis points. Year to date, it's been 40 basis points. And quarter to date, it's 40 basis points. And this is easily observable and capturable alpha that we have in the public markets. So this is as of one point in time, of course, this is as of September 30th, 2022. These numbers will move around. But you can see the consistency here. And but once we, we once we start taking into account private markets, and this is where again you know we will talk about this as we as we uh, as we discuss uh, Drew and Vince's plan the next few months, you will see you, we can clearly demonstrate the value added here, and the reason why you know we have done well relative to our peers, even though we take lower risk, is because of this alpha. So we do take lower risk than our peers, and you know, and Chiron has told us time and again that we should. Um, but at the same time, you've seen our performance, and again, Laura will talk about our performance relative to our peers later. You'll see that we are consistently top quartile, and the reason is the difference is this 30, 40, 50 basis points that we produce in alpha. And so, again, and, and if you look at our sharp ratio and Sortino ratios, not to get too technical here, it always puts us in the top quartile or top decile for that reason. So, so this is kind of inside baseball, Trustee. Bear with me. It's more of a JPC tech question. So, is it your sense then, as we design this system, Prabhu, that we won't count alpha from these types of categories until the money's in the bank, so to speak? The, the not necessarily, Drew. I mean, I think it's just we we've deliberately neutral it only because of the difficulty of benchmarking it. Uh, but when we have an incentive program, obviously Dinesh as the private markets investment officer is doing a terrific job and we need to be able to assess on a quantitative basis what we've done on the private markets as well. So we do have to talk about how to integrate the alpha and excess return from private markets as well. And if anything, it'll just show that we produce more alpha. Yeah, hey Dinesh, this is just outstanding. I don't Howard may have a better idea than I do, but I sort of track these numbers in the background as a VC dude. You Dinesh, you're knocking this, you're not gonna cover off this ball and the ball out of the park. Good for you. Uh so you need to jump in. Never jump in when you want to. I guess I, I didn't appreciate that uh, we didn't uh, include the private market alpha in this. So uh, thanks, Drew, for the pointing that out and this is probably more of a conversation for the investment committee but i guess if we uh it's it's essentially if we think about it as the opportunity of uh or the alternative to being in in a private market portfolio would be we already have a proxy right the russell 3000 and one way to look at alpha is essentially against that uh, because the alternative would be to invest in in a russell 3000 type of index is that a fair statement probably yeah, in, in fact, if you look at uh, Makita's report, you will see that we have a private markets benchmark 
but we also have an acqui plus 100 basis points, right? I mean, people feel that if you are investing in private markets, you should be able to do better than public markets. So they add, you know, 100 basis points or so to those public proxies to make sure that we are being compensated for the illiquidity that we have. Okay, thank you. Good, Prabhu, you're still driving. Okay, thank you, Drew. It, it looks like uh, I'm buffering here a bit, my internet. Uh, so thank you, Casey, for the excellent presentation. Uh, you know, private markets will continue to, you know, values will continue to come down um, over the next few quarters. But again, there's tremendous opportunities, as, as Sunita pointed out, and, and we're ready for those opportunities. Um, with that, I'm going to now invite uh, Laura and uh, Jared to talk about uh, the entire private markets report uh, presented by Makita. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a nice Thanksgiving break and um, happy December already. Um, I don't know what the weather's like in San Jose, but it really cooled off down here and I have my space heater running under my desk. Um, but I uh, hope you're all staying warm and, and having a good start to the holiday season. Um, I'll uh, start off with um, Makita's private markets report, which includes both the Newberger Berman private equity as well as um, the other private markets asset classes. And I think Jared's going to share his screen in a moment here. Um, uh, I can start off um, on page two. Let me get that up. Sorry, it's only letting me share both screens at once, not one at a time. So give me yes. one second, please. I know Prabhu said he had a buffering issue, but I also am getting the little black box of death that says your internet connection is unstable. So hopefully it doesn't uh, fail in the middle of this presentation. Let's see here. Um, I'll just I'll just start off as Jerry gets that up and um and page two is where we'll start. But I'll mention that all private markets asset classes, both the Newberger Berman private equity, the legacy private equity, and then the real assets, private debt, and real estate, um, all have um, IRRs that are above their public market equivalent. So if you recall, the way we calculate a public market equivalent is we take a public markets index. And we use cash flows on the actual days that the private markets uh, program pulled them and distributed them, since that, that's how the private markets funds work. And, um, and look at what your return would have been on the far right if you had invested these same funds in the public markets. Um, and so you can see that private markets has uh, provided a better IRR than that public market equivalent internal rate of return. And then if you look at the bottom and the total on the far right, the total internal rate of return of your private markets program since its inception back in 2005 has been 10.7%, um, so over 10%. So we still, this now includes, you know, six months of a, a bear market and some valuation write downs, but you still see some um, big benefits relative to public markets for the private markets program. Laura, if I could just uh, ask you a quick question there. Um, so so the new bug of fund, which has done extremely well, 29%, but uh, the PME IRR is 2.2. That's because the public markets during this time has done extremely well, right? Um, so, so the public market return would have been 2.2 um, because you do have um, the money that was called and the money that was distributed um, would not have done as well in the public markets during that time. So is, is, that the, is that the return of the public market equivalent or is it the comparison of Newberger versus the public market equivalent? So the 2.2 is the return of the public market equivalent. Oh, I see. So, it, so that includes, you know, recent yeah. losses in public markets. Okay, so that's a comparison. Okay, so it's 29% versus 2.2%. That's right. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, the first section that we have in here in terms of the individual asset classes is private debt. Um, so we, you can see here that private debt stood at 3.9%, just right around its 4% target. As you know, in some prior years, private debt was um, considered differently in an opportunistic bucket. Um, this program has been the weakest of the, um, of the private markets programs um, with an IRR still quite positive at 6.5%. And we can take a look at page six um, to look at the individual funds in this program. 
And you can see here that especially the funds that have been invested under the current staff, if we look about halfway down the page at 2017, 2018, 2019, and scroll your eyes over to the far right, you can see that the IRRs, um, these are versus peers and peer universes of funds here. So the IRRs of these funds have been um, quite strong relative to the peer IRRs. One notable exception is Eagle Point, which is towards the bottom. This is still a quite young fund, so hasn't been a full market cycle. Um, however, there have been some write downs given the fact that 75% of Eagle Point's investments are fixed rate loans. And given the rising interest rate environment, um, that hasn't been positive for, for fixed rate um, debt at this point. Um, the next program in here is the Real Assets Program, starting on page nine. So this is a very young program. Right now, it has an um, allocation of about 1.8% relative to a 4% policy target. But if you take a look at the green line on this, on this uh, chart here, um, your staff has been diligent and continuing to invest over time to build this program up with vintage year diversification in mind. Um, it's been a great program, especially given the situation with energy prices that we've had recently. You can see the IRR at the bottom of almost 15% for this program. Um, if we skip ahead um, to page nine, um, you can see the individual, um, okay, okay, on, on 12 here, you can see the individual investments. And this, as I mentioned, is a young program. You have a lot of not meaningful in the, um, that's what the NM is on the far right. You look at some of these investments like Kimmeridge Energy, just again, given, you know, oil prices in the energy environment and IRR of 42.7 relative to 13% for the peer group. Um, so a strong program thus far, um, despite its relative youth. And there was one new investment in this program um, during the uh, second quarter of 2022, it was the Aether Seed Partners Fund. The next program, uh, real estate, um, if we take a look at page 14, you can see that real estate's at 4.5% relative to its 4% policy target. Um, often we do want to overshoot just a little bit given the sort of um, the type of program this is where it distributes capital regularly. You can see also a very, very strong IRR here of 14.4% um, on the bottom. Um, on page 15, the next page, you can see that there were two new investments during the quarter that we're looking at both North American funds with, uh, with investments or commitments around 20 million, Pradium and AG, AIG GRE. Um, if we look at um, skipping ahead to 17, um, you can take a look at the individual investments. Same story here relative to the other programs. You know, some of the recent funds, quite strong returns. If you look about the middle of the way down, we look at GEM and DRA, um, Rock Point, um, both DRA funds here. DRA is a fund complex that Makita has been recommending for a very long time. Um, and we're glad that the, these funds are in the, um, the program here now. Um, one notable exception, um, again, a very young fund is um, Epizo 5. This is a European fund. So um, it is subject to the impact of um, exchange rates. And so Epizo would have had a 12% IRR since inception if we were looking at it in euros. But given the strength of the US dollar, you see a weaker return there. It does still provide some, some you know, currency diversification if we do see a different situation for the US dollar in the future. The last program I'll mention is Venture Capital, which is also a quite young program starting here on page 20. So the current allocation is under 1% relative to a 4% policy target. But you can see here with the green line that staff and, um, and your, your board in terms of its approvals has been diligent in allocating capital, but we have um, a not meaningful um, IRR thus far, given that it's such a new program. If we take a look at page 21, the next slide, you can see that there were two new um, investments of $5 million each um, in this quarter that we're looking at. And then on the next slide, or actually two slides ahead, we'll look at 23. And you can see the individual funds here, given that they're all investments in the last couple of years, the returns aren't yet meaningful. And the, the rest of this report just has a variety of slides on the private markets environment, but in the interest of time, <clears throat> I'm happy to take any questions on private markets before we, we move over to the full Fund report. Uh, floors open. Jump in, trustees. Hey, Laura. Yes. Uh, yes. Great presentation. I really like how you show the um, the allocation target versus where we are. Um, I just wanted to understand, given that the real estate uh, investment is higher than the policy target, why did we still make two new invest commitments this quarter? 
That's a great question. So the, the nature of the private markets program is that these funds are constantly giving back capital as well. And every individual fund has different rules around whether or not they can recycle capital. So as an example, imagine that you commit $10 million to a fund. It usually takes them you know, three to five years to actually call all of that capital as they make investments. And then as they sell off properties, they're, they're going to distribute it to you over time. So there's a lot of assumptions that go into how much we want to invest every year. Um, but every year, we and your staff um, bring pacing plans to the board um, to um, approve how much will be allocated each year. And those depend on a lot of assumptions around um, you know, how much capital each underlying fund is going to call and going to distribute. And so it's not sort of a perfect um, formula. And in an environment that we've seen recently, you might see, for example, a real estate fund that was going to sell an office building, maybe decide to hold on to that office building a bit longer, given that we're, we still have some sort of pandemic related, uh, will people come back to the office sort of situations and things like that. Um, so it's, it's difficult to predict exactly when the underlying funds are going to give you back your capital. So typically, you know, having a slight over allocation is common um, because we might have had some assumptions that they would have given back more. But we do think it's really important to continue to commit every year, even if you're slightly over target, um, so that you maintain that vintage year diversification. And, you know, investments made in 2022 might turn out to be a great vintage year, might not turn out to be a great vintage year. But if we skip vintage years, like you see here in 2016 and 2018, that can be pretty negative for returns if those turn out to be good years. So we try to spread things out evenly um, and you can see that happening for the past several years. Okay, but is there a, is, is, it, is it with 10%? Is that my recollection within which you can stay uh, over the target? Um, so the, the target ranges are around the asset class as a whole for private markets. Um, I'd have to go to look, take a look at the public markets report to see what the, what the oh. range is. But, um, but you know, the, the, the amount that's invested is, is um, coming from that approved pacing study um, that will renew, um, you know, in the new year to look at whether or not we should um, commit more or less. And then, as you know, when we do the broad asset allocation study, sometimes we change targets. So for example, I think private debt used to have a higher target than it does now. So we're sort of working our way down, trying to maintain vintage years of diversification by continuing to invest, but maybe doing smaller commitment amounts than we have in the past. Okay. I mean, I guess it seems, uh, uh, you, even if we stay within, a, it seems a little illogical to say we will invest in every vintage year when, when we are at the cap, um, the, because a fund may not return its capital, right? Particularly in a real estate market that's massively correcting right now. So uh, yeah, if your entire fund was private markets, that'd be something we'd want to be extra careful about. But given that private markets are a, a portion of an overall fund where you have a lot of liquidity, um, we don't think it's a major risk to have slight over allocations and under allocations to private markets asset classes as you get up to those, those targets that you're targeting. Interestingly, Sunita, that debate has been a big one for the last 20 years um, in the university endowment fund investments in VCs. And I think what Laura said would, I, I probably hadn't even been resolved yet, but the, I think the general swing of that sentiment was, shoot, you got to keep going with every vintage year because there really is no way to tell until, as I said before, the money's in the bank. So I think that's the right strategy, um, Laura. And if it exceeds the policy benchmark, I think let's just shine a light on it and you know make sure we're willing to exceed that uh, limit if it should ever happen. Thanks, uh, Laura. And Sunita. So floor is still open. Uh, you're driving, Prabhu and Laura. Okay. Thank you, I thank you Drew. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Just, I, I just uh, to Drew's point, uh, and that is a real issue for a lot of endowments especially in VC space, just given how well the asset class has performed. And in some endowments, I've noticed that uh, they're they overweight VC by you know, as much as 15 or 20%, uh, just given uh, great performance. But but uh, to Sunita's question, yeah, we do look at the broad asset classes rather than you know the sub-asset categories uh, for the 10%. And if we are consistently overweight an asset class. I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. One is to is to say maybe we should be allocating less, uh, though I would like to stick to vintage or diversification. And the other is to simply say maybe we should actually move up the allocation to that particular asset class. And those are discussions we can have again at the at the beginning of next year 
when we revisit our SAA uh, policy. Um, with that, Laura, I'll turn this back to you for 2D and 2E. All right, Jared is going to start us off with the public markets report for the pension. Thanks, Laura. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, so we'll cover a little bit of a macro overview as of 930 um, before we get into the pension plan itself. Uh, so just to start off here on page five, uh, you can see uh, two very different outcomes here between last year and this year. Uh, 2021 was great for most asset classes and 2022 has been the opposite. Uh, 2022, unfortunately, marks the worst start to a year ever for the bond market, uh, given the rate rises that we've seen. Um, so if you remember at the beginning of the year, the most popular view was that inflation was transitory. There might be a couple Fed rate hikes this year, uh, and clearly neither of those uh, were accurate assumptions. Um, so we've basically had several macro factors that have been impacting markets this year. Uh, inflation, most importantly, and, and with that rising interest rates, but also you know concerns of future growth of raising rates too much. Uh, the war in Ukraine, China lockdowns from COVID. So there's been several um, factors happening that have resulted in markets performing the way they have. Uh, if I jump to page six, just cover a couple of points here on uh, regional asset classes. So in the in the U.S. space um, for the quarter, you'll see that large caps um, underperform small caps. So if you look at the Russell 1000 falling 4.6 versus the Russell 2000 falling 2.2. A lot of that from the larger tech names um, dragging down the large cap space. Um, on page seven, I think the uh, foreign equity returns here have a couple of interesting things to see. Uh, you see China here at the bottom year to date falling more than 30% um, with multiple issues that we've just discussed before um, happening there. Since the end of nine of uh, September 30th, so the past couple of months, China is up about 8%, but that trails most of the rest of the world as well, which has bounced back even more. Um, and I think the most interesting thing on this page is just to look at what the US dollar um, strength, you know, what that impact has had as a US investor. So you see, if you look at the third line, year to date, the IFA and local currency has fallen 14.5%, but when we translate that to dollars, um, it's almost twice as bad. Um, so the U.S. dollar strengthening, or if you want to look at it as foreign currencies weakening, um, has had a huge impact um, to U.S. dollar investors in foreign markets. Uh, and then for fixed income here on page eight, um, like I said, bonds are off to their worst start to a calendar year ever. Um, I think there's been some nine-month windows that were, uh, you know, just as bad, maybe worse, but for the first uh, nine months to a year, this is the worst start uh, that the Barclays aggregate has seen. Uh, the good news is that bond yields are much more attractive now and, and going forward return expectations are a lot better for bonds now uh, than they have been in a while. So there is some good news uh, despite the pain in, inflicted in getting to this point. Um, I'll move to page 11 just to kind of keep the theme on bonds and look at the yield curve here. So you see that the green line, which is at the end of the year, the yield curve was upward sloping, um, but obviously pretty low all the way across the board. And you fast forward nine months to the pink line here at the top, uh, you can see that rates are much higher across the board, but that the slope of that curve is gone. And there's actually um, two year rates were higher than 10 year rates. Um, so the yield curve inverted, uh, which is often tied to, uh, you know, preceding recessions. It's not a perfect relationship. So we can't say for sure that that will happen again. I think there's also a lot of, um, you know, talk on is the 10 year lower than the two year because of economic reasons or just because the US market has so much more attractive rates than other places that there's so much, um, you know, international interest in the 10 year that that's a little bit of why the 10 year is lower as well. Um, but anyway, much different yield curve shape and levels versus nine months ago uh, or at this point, 11 months ago. Um, I'll move to page 12, uh, which is obviously the the main talking points over the last few months have been around inflation. Um, so you see here the highest inflation since the 80s, um, which has hopefully peaked. Um, the Fed doesn't look at CPI exactly, but in general, um, you know, as you know, the Fed is raising rates to target um, you know, this trend line that has seen inflation spike up so much. Um, I think one challenge is this is especially true in Europe, is that rate hikes 
don't solve supply issues. They don't change the war on Ukraine. They don't um, change lockdowns in China. So Fed rate hikes have some influence on inflation, but there's other factors that are affecting inflation that um, rate hikes are not going to, uh, to impact. I'll, just a couple more slides here in the economic um, section on page 14. There's a lot of words and numbers on this page, but in general, what it's showing is that uh, the IMF has lowered growth forecasts uh, for many parts of the world and raised inflation forecasts at the same time. Um, probably not surprising uh, to hear either of those two things. And then I'll finish formal comments here on page 19, just look at the unemployment picture. Um, so unemployment data is pretty good. And there's low levels of employment. Uh, we're pretty much back at, at pre-pandemic levels. Uh, one issue here is that you know, strong employment, wage gains, all of that reinforces uh, the inflation issue, issue, which is what the Fed is obviously trying to combat. And so I think the Fed is willing to have a little more unemployment if it means lower inflation. Um, so ultimately, there's a few kind of macro factors um, you know, that I mentioned that likely lead to maybe some continued to high volatility. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll stop there and see if, if Laura wants to add anything or Prabhu uh, or see if anybody has any questions on the economic piece. Yeah, maybe we get into performance. Um, you know, I think um, your CIO mentioned we have seen some stronger returns in, in the past, you know, since the end of uh, when this report was produced. Um, but Jared, please proceed. Sure. So I'll move to page 31. Um, so at the end of 930, we have about 4.4 billion in assets. That's pretty much the same as it was at the end of June 30th. Um, and the way that happened is, is that inflows roughly offset investment losses to end up at the same spot. Um, and as, as we've talked about, performance has been pretty good since the end of 930. So today we would estimate assets closer to 4.7 billion. Um, you see all allocations are uh, within the target range here um, as usual. Uh, on page 32, we can look at some returns, um, which as we've discussed are, are better um, since this report was run, um, quite a bit better in, in certain markets. Um, but to look at 930, you see returns are negative here uh, across recent time periods, which certainly no one wants to see. However, if you look on a relative basis, uh, the plan has handily outpaced the 60-40 portfolio um, over, over more recent periods. And not only that, the plan has outpaced the peer group median, the policy benchmark, and the investable benchmark over um, you know, every period, five years and in. Um, so I think, you know, given the market backdrop, staff has done a very impressive job. Uh, it's a very difficult environment to generate relative returns uh, and outperform everything we're looking at here over multiple periods. Um, and this is also where um, I'm not sure probably if you want to make any additional comments on your um, alpha. Uh, I think you're probably referencing this page earlier, so I wasn't sure if you want to add anything while I'm here. No, thanks, Jared. This is the page I was referring to earlier uh, to Drew's question, and you can see across all time periods here, you can look at the funds return versus the investable benchmark portfolio, which is the right uh, proxy benchmark for us. And you can see that net of, and these numbers are net of fees and we have outperformed uh, across every time period. Again, this is as of one particular day, 930, and this may change on 1231 or any subsequent quarter. But in general, you can see over longer periods that the plan has done better than the underlying benchmark. Hey, Prabhu, uh, just refresh my memory. What is an investable benchmark? The investable actually takes into account the private market spacing plan. Uh, so the policy benchmark will include the entire private markets benchmark as opposed to the investable, which takes into account that we're not fully invested in private markets. Ah, okay. Yeah, very impressive. Right, very nice chart, uh, table. Thank you. Okay. Um, from here, I'll jump to page 37 just to highlight a couple of sections within the portfolio. Here at the top, you see Artisan Global Opportunities, which is one of the larger weighted individual investments. 
Um, so despite the negative return, you can see for the quarter, a top decile finish, beating the benchmark by more than 200 basis points. Um, and the strategy has done pretty well since inception. If you look off the far right, um, almost top decile since it was added to the plan. Uh, another section I'll highlight uh, that we typically don't, but is especially um, impressive returns here is just the low beta section um, in general. And if you look at the bottom of the table, the relative value hedge funds generating significant positive returns despite a uh, negative environment for the benchmark. So some nice help from that section of the portfolio as well. Um, and then the last page I'll cover as a prepared comments is just to highlight page 61. Um, probably mentioned this a while ago, just talking about sharp ratio and Sortino ratio. Um, but it's very impressive here. This is for the three year period looking at peers, uh, you know, defined benefit plans over a billion in assets. If you look at the first column, that's return. You see a near top quartile finish here. Standard deviation also has a best quartile finish there. Um, and that's resulted in top quartile sharp ratio, which is risk adjusted return looking at all risk and Sortino ratio, um, a top quintile finish here. And this is looking at risk adjusted returns specific to downside returns. Um, so anyway, this highlights the, the very impressive pure relative um, and very nice risk adjusted returns that the plan has had uh, for the three year period, but this is also true for some other periods. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and see if anybody has any questions um, on the plan's performance. Thanks, Jay. Jump in, trustees. Floor's open. Uh, Jared, I have a question. Uh, the last page that you just went over, is that for the entire plan or just the public portion of the plan? Uh, this is the entire plan. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, well, if nobody else has a question, I have a second question. Uh, I, I just wanted maybe between you and Laura, get your thoughts on the tips component of a portfolio. I know it's kind of a small allocation, but I kind of want to get a sense of uh, the purpose and and the performance that you've seen recently. Sure. Um, so generally, given that we try to um, develop long-term portfolios to respond to a variety of different market environments, um, having a tips allocation is usually part of our strategic recommendations for most of our clients, um, given that we can see um, environments where fixed rate um, investment grade bonds like we've seen recently, which of course we didn't anticipate the, the worst start ever <laughs> to a year, um, but we like to have some diversification um, into tips. And so one thing that's been great in your plan is that you have short-term tips. Um, a lot of investors have market duration tips, which actually have a duration that's a little bit longer than investment grade bonds. And so even though tips are indexed to inflation, you've seen some, some really more negative returns for broad tips allocations. Um, you had shifted um, to short-term tips in your plan. And so you can see that the short-term tips, um, you know, we shifted that money from <clears throat> investment grade bonds. So investment grade bonds being down 14.3% for the, for the year to date period and <clears throat> tips only being down 3.9% has been you know, a positive um, uh, sort of relative driver of performance and um, protector of some of the assets relative to just broad investment grade bonds. Yeah, the reason why I was asking was, I was thinking that TIPS was more for inflation protection and it doesn't seem like you know, in the worst inflation environment we've seen in a while that that component came through. I think if the short duration what you were seeking I'm wondering, I'm just questioning whether we shouldn't put in short duration bonds. Yeah, short duration bonds were also negative. Um, I would have to look up the exact negative return. Um, but, you know, I think if you think about this tips allocation as relative to investment grade bonds, um, you know, we want to we want to maintain a certain amount in fixed income in your funds so that you feel comfortable taking risk on private markets and public equities and can maintain you know, um, some of the assets that need to be paid out in benefits and whatnot. So assuming that we want to keep a certain amount in fixed income, we think the diversification into short-term tips makes sense. And so that protection relative to the investment grade bonds has been a positive. Okay, thank you. Of course.
You're still driving, Prabhu. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And so uh, with that, we move on to 2E, but before Laura and Jared can start on that, I, I, I don't want to forget, I want to let the board know that la on November 9th, I did present the fee report to the city council and uh, with trustee Ganapati. And so thanks, thanks to her for accompanying me. I believe the fee report was well received. Vice Mayor Jones noted with satisfaction that we brought down our management fees over the last five years. And Mayor-elect Mahan actually asked the question we've been working on, has your plan added value after fees and costs? So has there been alpha generated after all costs? And I gave him the numbers and he noted that with satisfaction that we have done that. We have done quite well compared to our benchmarks. With that, I'll turn this back to Laura. Great, thank you. So um, I will, uh, in a concise manner, talk about the healthcare trust. Um, we have, uh, starting on page 29 here, because all of the prior slides are um, the economic market environment, which Jared discussed on the pension portfolio. So if you take a look at page 29, you can see the healthcare trust current balance, um, just under 260 million as of the end of September. And then we can uh, skip forward to performance of the fund. You can see that the third quarter of 2022 um, had a negative return of 4.9% for the one year period down 13.2. Um, you can see the peer relative returns are um, for the longer time periods, pretty close to median. Um, if you recall, this is a riskier sort of healthcare trust given the target return that you're, you're aiming for um, in terms of your actuarial expectations. Um, it has come down a little bit. Um, historically, the expected return of the target actuarial assumed rate of return for this fund was the same as the pension. And so a lot of, a lot of funds take a lot less risk in their healthcare trust um, than the pension. This fund um, is a bit riskier, which has worked out really well um, in most of the years since the global financial crisis. I actually looked back at the report as of the end of December 2021. And the performance for every trailing time period at that point was in the top quartile of the peer group. But then when we have a negative market environment, this plan being a bit riskier than its peers means that peer relative performance in the, the recent near term has been um, a bit more negative. You still see the one year pretty close to median and the three year in the top quartile. Um, in terms of individual managers, as you know, you have the same um, a few of the same managers in this fund as you do on the pension, but most of it is indexed um, to passive low fee um, indexes. So I'm happy to answer any questions on the healthcare trust. Floor is open. Um, Laura, we should be more risky, right? This is still a nascent uh, fund. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? Um, I think given the liquidity information that we're aware of, the ongoing contributions, um, it's uh, it's reasonable to have this be riskier than peers. Great. Thanks. Floor is open. All right. Uh, Prabhu, do you want to wrap us up? Uh, yeah, nothing further, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Laura and Jared for the excellent presentation. And we've also, again, noted with some satisfaction our performance. You know, it's been a down year. We, we did well last year and an up year. And in a down year, we continue to do well relative to our peers. And as Jared's chart pointed out on the Sortino ratio, uh, we we take less risk than our peers. So we are in the top quartile, meaning we've taken less risk. And our performance has also been in the top quartile, meaning we've actually on an absolute basis also done better than our peers. The combination of that puts us again in the top quartile of uh, our peers on a risk adjusted basis, which is what we've been aiming for for a few years now. So, <laughs> which on the spot, Prabhu. So Vince was right 10 years ago, wasn't he? Yes, he, he was right. Uh, we do need to take less risk than our peers. And uh, we've done that for a few years now. And, uh, you know, the market presented us an opportunity to re-risk the portfolio and the boards moved very quickly to do it at the right time. And so we've sort of 
on the downside we were protected when when there was a when there was a drawdown in uh, in the last bear market and on the upside we immediately participated by increasing our beta so while we are not really market timers I, I like to think of our moves as more strategic and we've sort of kept on to that higher risk level now though it's lesser than our peers we are yeah. still sort of within the 12 percent level that that uh, eileen has and Veris has told us to be within so but i'm gonna put you on the spot laura so am i smoking crack here laura this is extraordinary right the, the peer relative returns are, are quite good. You know, it's, you, you can never predict the market environment that you're going to have. Um, but uh, I think being being far lower risk than peers didn't work out in in, uh, in many market environments. And so um, I, I still maintain that it's uh, I, I've never seen the timing work out so well. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You know, in my, in, my, in my 20 years in the industry and Makita's, you know, longer, much longer history. Um, the fact that you all re-risked when you did at the start of the pandemic and actually were willing to take that leap. You know, we have a lot of folks that de-risk over a long period of time and they say they're going to get more risky when the time is right and then it never happens. So the fact that you all did that is is really remarkable. Well, you know, Laura, my my favorite quote of all time is from baseball manager Branch Rickey. When he in, you'll know the quote. And it's longer, it's embedded in a much longer quote that explains it. But he said, luck is the residue of design. Which is what you're saying. Look, we got lucky, but we set you ourselves up to get a fortune papers of prepared mind. Um, great. Um, any of my other questions? Um, I'll notice we're not carrying over any old business, so section three is empty. Over to you, Roberto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to everyone. Um, I hope you all had a chance to uh, had a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving uh, holiday. So welcome back to your last board meeting of the calendar year. So let me start by um, congratulating, as uh, Chair Lanza indicated earlier this morning, uh, the four trustees that sought reappointment uh, at the board and were reappointed uh, by the city council in November. So I want to welcome Vic, Sunita, and Eswar, and Howard back for another four-year term. Uh, your hard work and dedication uh, to the plan and the plan members uh, uh, is greatly appreciated. So we welcome you back and look forward to working with you for the next four years. So thank you very much and congratulations. Um, I also wanted to uh, let you know, uh, we have been over time uh, discussing the possibility that at some point, we are going to go back to in-person meetings. Uh, it remains to be seen when would that take place, whether it's going to be February, March, possibly even as far as April. Uh, assuming no uh, significant changes in the COVID-19 pandemic, I foresee something happening uh, sometime in the first quarter 2023 or as, as indicated uh, as early as April 2023. The reason I'm bringing this up is because um, some of you are new to the board, but some of you had had a chance to actually attend in-person meetings. You are aware that our meetings were scheduled for the uh, uh, city hall, the wings rooms, uh, right where the uh, city hall is and where, right next to where the city council meets on a weekly basis. Um, that area actually is going to be going some renovations and improvements over the next six months between Ju uh, January and July. I'm only saying this because we are going to be working with the city to find out uh, when we are scheduled to go back to in-person meetings, uh, where we will have those meetings. Right now, uh, my educated guess is that it will be either at the actual city council chamber or uh, our fifth floor location in our building uh, on the first street or a combination of. So we will keep you posted, but I just wanted to let you know that that's the case. We are not able to meet back at this, at the wings rooms uh, until uh, the second half of 2023. Um, so with that, I just wanted to, uh, let you know that staff is also working on the recruitment 
uh, for uh, a position that was vacated uh, by Marty Sarate, uh, Sarate of the administrative group uh, with heavy timing. So we are working with uh, HR to kick off uh, the process uh, for recruiting for that position. We will keep it posted and uh, keeping it with staff. I also wanted to let you know that Maribel Garcia was recently selected and, and, uh, and promoted to the senior supervisor position. She started working with our office in 2014 and has worked in accounting investments and now in the benefits area. So she will be our new senior supervisor for the benefits area. So um, congratulations to Maribel and uh, good luck to you. We'll look forward to working with you and the rest of the staff. Uh, also, just yesterday, the retiree open enrollment uh, was completed. Um, that's the time of the month of November where retirees get the chance to uh, either stay with the uh, health care provider that they have or make whatever changes are necessary. I don't have all the data at this point of what took place. I know we were quite busy the first two weeks of the month. Uh, so at the next meeting, uh, I will provide you with any kind of data related to open enrollment. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, it was uh, it went through it uh, without a hiccup, uh, especially uh, in light of the fact that this was the first year of the last three that we actually had an in-person uh, open enrollment. We actually met at the um, with members. Uh, Barbara, if you remind me, I think is where the federated retiree group usually have their meetings. Uh, do you remember the location, Barbara? Leninger Center? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Is, is there anything else you want to mention about the open enrollment month? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so lastly, I wanted to comment on a couple of more things. One was uh, we actually have a quarterly staff meeting. We've been having them for almost 10 years. And uh, so we had one last month where we keep uh, the staff up to date on the latest, not only at the board level, but at the city council and uh, provide some training and information uh, to the staff. And lastly, I just Kind of want to give you a sense of the upcoming uh, Christmas holiday and let you know that the offices of retirement services will be closed uh, from December 23rd through December 26th and again from December 30th to uh, January 2nd. We will have a, a very small staff at the office the week of uh, the 27th to the 29th of December. Uh, because of the closure. So we'll have some staff at the office, but it, it will not be the usual number of staff. And uh, that will be to, obviously to provide customer service. We still do have sometimes customers come by the office, although obviously not as much as they used to before the pandemic. Mr. Chair, that concludes my, my update. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions about my comments or any other questions that are out there, either by you board members or the public. Thank you. Uh, great. Floor's open. Anybody got anything for Roberto? Uh, if not, hey, Pam, good to see you. Happy holidays. Over to you. Happy holidays to everyone. It's, uh, it's a good time of the year, don't you think? Uh, I'm, uh, a couple of things. First, I want to thank all of you as trustees for taking your responsibility to protect and preserve the retirement funds of our current retirees and our future retirees. Your fiduciary responsibility is immense. And as uh, someone who also manages some trustee funds, I understand how important that fiduciary relationship is. So I just want to acknowledge the work that you do. And it's clear by the questions that you asked around the investments and the returns that you are all very knowledgeable and concerned about where the, the assets are going and protected and, and invested. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank you for that. Also, I wanna thank Sunita, Howard, Eswar and Dick also for 
ask uh, for putting in to be reappointed and I'm glad we reappointed you at the council meeting. I know a couple members of the public had some critical things but to say, but don't worry about them. They're just people who come to our committee meetings every day and they say the same uh, things. I'm used to it as a council member, but as trustees, you're probably not used to hearing that kind of language, but I have complete trust and confidence in all of you. And I really uh, am grateful for you being there and watching over these funds. Um, so we've got a lot going on. We have a new mayor, as you know, and we have a fairly new council. In uh, January, the new mayor takes over and we have only four veteran council members returning, I among them. The rest uh, are new council members with two vacancies. The, on Monday, we have a special meeting to discuss how we will uh, replace or how we will fill the vacancy, be it a special election or be it uh, an interim port appointment followed by a special election or a, an appointment. It's, uh, the appointment would be to fill out the term, which is just a two year term remaining. And uh, then uh, anyone appointed could, could run again or could run. So that's that uh, you've probably seen a lot of messages about that. The, the conversation is around the cost of the uh, special election, but I've received quotes from the the city clerk's office that the could be as high as a $10 million if we hold a traditional election where people can go into the polls and vote versus about half that if it's a mail-in ballot. So um, to me, uh, I, I really, I come down on this issue on the side of voting for having the two districts who have open vacancies, District 8 and 10, to allowing them to vote. I would certainly want to be able to vote if I had a vacancy in my district. So that's where I'm coming down at, at the moment in, in case you ask. Um, with the new council meeting at council and with the new mayor, there may be new committee assignments. So this may be my last meeting here, I don't know. I don't know what I will get and uh, what the may new mayor will ask me to do. We'll be sitting down and discussing where I'd like to go. I've certainly enjoyed serving on this board for you with you and have learned a lot about these assets, these investments and really value the work that you do. And I know your job is to protect the assets, but I also know that you, um, take very seriously the unfunded liabilities and the effect on the uh, of the unfunded liabilities on our general budget. So I, I, I just wanna honor and acknowledge all of the work that you do and the responsibility, the immense responsibility that you have. Um, I think that's all I have to say, other than it's it's been a pleasure. I don't know if I'll be back in January or not, uh, hopefully, but we'll see. So with that, I'll close and and uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Great. Hey, Roberto, can I ask you a favor? Would you mind sending a very short, friendly note to the mayor? I'm um, indicating that we have some really important financial work in 2023. Thank him for reappointing our members. And would you ask him if he would just courtesy of um, trying to leave Pam in place, if you're willing to serve him, it sounds like you are, Pam. I'd hate to see you turn over at such critical time, Pam. You've been great to work with. I appreciate that, Drew. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Would, uh, should I send that? You should send it, right, Roberto? Uh, yeah, I can send it. Um, <laughs> well, the current mayor, it, Sam DiCardo, I can send the thank you. But the mayor yeah. elect with the yeah. council, uh, the mayor elect will be then selecting uh, the committee assignments for the new year. So it will not be Sam. So it will be sort of like two separate. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean the new mayor. Yeah, have you you met him, right, Roberto? Yes, I, I met uh, Councilmember Mayhem. Correct. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. And right. uh, and I do want to. I want to say to Pam, thank you for your uh, years uh, uh, working with the trustees of the of the Board of Retirement for Police and Fire. And of course, as you know, I, I can't speak for the process. Uh, I leave that up to you. But I'm sure you. I suspect you could uh, ask to come back to this board 
And as Chair Lance I indicated, uh, they will welcome you to open arms. So if there's anything I can do, if you think that uh, Mayor Alec Mayhem would like to talk to us, I'm happy to speak to him as well. But anyway, good luck to you and thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, floor's open. Any questions for Pam? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Dick Santos. Sure, jump in, Dick. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Foley, for your service. And I hope that you do return because your experience and your relationship with us has been extraordinary. And, and, and I've served for something like 26 years on the retirement board. And I said with the prior council, and I want to say your knowledge and expertise in helping out is really a difference. Uh, if I was you, I would, um, let's take this back. The cost of this election you're talking about, I don't understand any of it when it comes to the county. I hope you'll look into that because we face the same thing in the water district and it's unreasonable, the cost of an election. But I totally support what you're saying. The only way is have a democracy and let people vote. So thank you for your um, service to all of us. I hope you return. Dick, thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Great. Uh, anybody else? Um, I, Robert, I'll turn it over to you. Don't make some perfectory remarks before Chiron goes. Go. You, you're running the show, Roberto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, next item in the agenda is the discussion and action on the final results of the actual evaluation for the pension plan by Chiron. We'd like to welcome Bill Hallmark for the presentation. Um, at the last meeting, you board actually received the preliminary results. I'm not sure that they change uh, at all, if any, uh, from the last time. Uh, and in this particular presentation, which should be uh, short and sweet, I think uh, we are looking for actual action by you board to approve the evaluation. Uh, the attachments include uh, the shorter presentation by, by Bill and of course, and, and also includes the actual evaluation report for your reference, which have all the detailed information of the work uh, by Kyron. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Good morning, Bill, welcome. Good morning, thank you, Roberto. Uh, let me uh, bring up the presentation here. Okay, uh, and I have Ann Harper with me to help present these results. Uh, and let me get going here. I uh, just wanted to put this in context. Roberto already explained that uh, last month we presented the draft pension valuation results. These are the final uh, results. There's very minor changes uh, from the final, from the draft results. Uh, so mostly we'll be looking at what this means looking forward in this presentation. Uh, we also, uh, in the next agenda item, have the draft OPEB valuation results. Uh, because we've got the final pension done this month, uh, we will not be at the January board meeting, but we'll be back at the February board meeting to present the final OPEB valuation. So, uh, this chart looks remarkably similar to uh, the chart we presented last month. Uh, the funded status on uh, market value of assets basis dropped from 87% to 78% uh, over the year, but on the smooth actuarial value, it increased from 77 to 80%. Uh, you can see the breakdown by tier on the right-hand side. Uh, I think probably since we went through this uh, last time, I think the thing I just want to note is the difference in size between the tiers. Tier two has been around for a little while, but it is still a very young tier. And uh, the liabilities in that tier are, are very, very small compared to the tier one uh, liability. Tier two is more than 100% funded. Uh, it's tier one that is uh, not 100% funded. Uh, the other thing I would note on this chart is, is the uh, blue and the gold are the liabilities for members who are no longer working for the city, whereas the red is the liability for the active members 
the blue and the gold represents about 70% of the liability for the plan. So most of that liability is for people who no longer work for the city. Bill, can I ask a quick question? If you don't yes. mind, you yeah, have... please jump in with any questions during our presentation. Just for, for sake of reference, how does that compare to first our peers across the state and second across the, the whole nation? Did you look at the next slide? That was a great <laughs> transition. <laughs> See, didn't you tell me to set this up for you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Glad we coordinated that, Roberto. Um, so the left side chart here is showing the, the funded ratio uh, based on the market value of assets. Uh, the gold diamonds are the your plan, and the bars are the range in the public plan database, which is about uh, 220 plans, uh, large public plans across the, the country. And you can see in the uh, early 2000s, we were among the best funded plan. Uh, after uh, 2009, we were still uh, better than, than the median. Uh, we dropped down to around the, the median and, and peaked up a little bit um, with the 2021 returns. Now, keep in mind- Hey, Bill, hey, Bill is, true. is that mostly due to us lowering the discount rate? Yes, you guys are right on top of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the discount, you lowered the discount rate early compared to other plans. Uh, other plans have been uh, catching up, uh, but the median in the public plan database in 2021 was still 7% and you're at 6.625. So there is a clear difference here because of your lower discount rates. Uh, that same story holds in the right-hand chart. This is from our survey of California systems. We're looking at 39 different California systems and their funded status based on the market value of assets. Uh, you were uh, above the median, dropped to the median, and a little bit below. Uh, in 2021, you shot uh, well above the, the median with your investment returns. Uh, we don't have the statistics for 2022 yet for uh, all the California systems. Uh, but again, your discount rate is lower than most of the, the systems in California. Uh, so that makes a difference in this measure as well. Hey, uh, Bill, just a question on that. Um, why do the blue, light blue bars on the right side look so big? It's 75, 75th percentile and higher. Yeah, so uh, so the, on the California chart, I should have pointed this out, we go all the way up to the maximum funded ratio. So uh, the city of Fresno plans have been uh, very well funded and an outlier. And so the top of the light blue bars are the city of Fresno plans. Uh, most of the other plans are, are much lower. <clears throat> So it, it, that light blue bar stretches up a lot to, to reach that one plan or two plans. So each client is stretching out the blue, is it? Yeah, because the, the blue goes all the way up to the maximum funded. So the um, oh okay. So it's going from the 75th percentile all the way up to the, the maximum. In the um in the public plans data chart, we only go to the 95th percentile. So any of those outliers are are ignored. Okay, thanks. Bill, sorry to bother you. Um, you did address a lot of the issues. I was actually, my question was, for, if you go back one more slide, my, my question was, I guess you can look at it in the graph, but it was particularly, as it relates to the the ratio of the pay status versus the in pay uh, versus the active members compared to the other systems, that's uh, that was a more more specific question I was asking. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, I, I wasn't clear enough. So no, no worries. <laughs> so uh, I I don't have that specifically. So I'm just relying on my my experience. I'd say most of the other plans I see it's about 60 to 65% uh, for the in-pay. 
and your plan is around 70. So uh, it's a more mature plan uh, than what we're typically seeing. Thank you. Uh, contribution rates. So uh, this, <laughs> this uh, chart did not change too much since the last time. In particular, the, the contribution rates stayed about the same. Uh, the dollar amount contribution uh, for the city actually went down uh, by about a million dollars uh, due to the adoption of 2.5% uh, inflation and amortization payment growth. So we increased the amortization payment growth from two and a quarter to two and a half, which reduced the, the current amortization payment for the city slightly increasing it later on. Uh, so I think the, the thing I wanna point out here uh, and, and really to set up the next slide is we focus a lot on how much of the contribution is going to pay down the UAL and how much is going to pay the interest on the UAL, the unfunded. And, and these are projected from our valuation to the next year when the payments are being made. But so following the 2021 valuation, we were expecting for fiscal year 2023, about 41% of pay in the contribution, or about over a hundred million dollars, is going directly to pay down the principal of the unfunded liability. So we've got our contribution rates high enough that it's paying down, paying the interest, and then paying a hundred and six million dollars was the expectation for how much it pays down on the UAL. Now, when you get uh, a lot of that is because we had great investment returns. So it reduced the UAL and reduced that interest on the UAL that we were expecting. In 2022, we had the reverse where the investment returns were poor. And so the interest on the UAL shot up. And so the amount that is going to actually reduce the dollar amount of the UAL has shrunk. Um, that it is to be expected. The interest on the UAL is calculated based on the market value of assets. It will fluctuate uh, a lot from year to year, and we want the contribution to be smoother than that. And so the contribution is only recognizing a part of that, that change from year to year. But even with those losses, we're projecting for 2024 that the contribution about 65 million of it would go to reduce the actual dollar amount of the UAL. So that's a critical part of our, our strategy is over time to have the contributions high enough to be paying down the, the dollar amount of the UAL. Uh, and you're paying down a pretty significant dollar amount each year <clears throat> in that UAL. And so we wanted to show you a comparison to the plans in the public plan database. And on the prior slide, I was emphasizing that those are the projected amounts at the time of the valuation. And we have a one-year delay um, between the valuation and when the contribution rates go in. Uh, to get the figures out of the public plan database, uh, we, we look backwards. And so we look at what the actual uh, UAL was at the beginning of the year and what the actual contributions were that came in during the year. So it doesn't match up exactly with the, the prior slide. Uh, but this is the amount of the UAL principal rate each year uh, from 2011 through now to 2022. Uh, and you can see there are a couple takeaways here. I want you to see. One is um, you're the gold diamond, and look how volatile the gold diamond is compared to the bars. And, and that really worked to our advantage in 2022 when we had uh, good investment returns. Uh, that really shoots that percentage up. 
but it's much more volatile than what we see with other plants. And, and that gets back to the theme we've talked about every year about how mature the plant is and how you're more sensitive uh, to changes. And, and that works both for and against you. The other thing I'd note is even given that volatility, uh, for the most part, you've been at the upper ends of this chart and being really, um, I would say, very responsible about keeping the contributions at a level to pay down the UAL. Uh, you can see even back in, back in 2011, there were very few plans uh, that had increased their contributions sufficiently after 2009 uh, to make any progress on the UAL. Very few plans. And that has gra gradually improved over time uh, to where now we've got about half the plans uh, making payments to pay down their UAL, but only half the plans. Uh, whereas your plans, you've had a year or two where you've fallen uh, below based on the market value where we'd have a market value loss and the contributions in place did not cover it. Uh, but that quickly uh, changed and, and recovered. So uh, I think this shows both the, the volatility you're susceptible to and also how responsible um, you've been at trying to pay down the UAL for this plan. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Anne to take us through the next sections. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Bill focused mostly on the historical aspects of, of the pension plan, the funded status um, and contributions, and actually where we are today with this current valuation. I'm going to look more towards the future with some projections. So starting with um, projections of the funded status and the unfunded accrued liability. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, uh, of this graph, and we're looking at deterministic projections, meaning that all assumptions are met each and every year uh, going forward. And we know that that's not reality, but that's that's based on our actuarial assumptions. And it's also based on the fact that the plan is going to earn 6.625% each and every year. So on the left-hand side, it's showing the path that the plan is on to get to 100% funding. Mm -hmm. um, Historically, you were at 74%. Um, now you're at 78% funded, and this is on a market value basis. And you can see that the plan is making great progress, especially in the first five to 10 years of this projection. And that's when the contribution rates are a bit higher. Um, then moving to the historical and projected UAL, uh, outstanding UAL. Um, I think to note on this slide, we're showing both the market UAL and the actuarial uh, UAL. And to note here specifically is how drastic and significant that UAL uh, balance is dropping over the course of the next five to 10 years. And this is a result um, of, you know, the, the drop is a result of the board's amortization policy to kind of smooth out um, the UAL being paid for. And um, it's also you're more at the tail end of your overall amortization periods for all your layers. So um, again, when Bill was showing you historically what it looked like paying your unfunded accrued liability, this also shows going forward that you're on the right trajectory and um, a path to pay down that unfunded. So as Bill mentioned earlier, the um, tier two is fully funded. So there's no UAL payments going towards tier two. All of the amortization layers are for tier one. Um, and you can see that this is uh, all of the different layers that you have. And you, starting in 2024, you have over 30 layers of your unfunded accrued liability. And what does that, that mean? If you look at it in terms of maybe an individual home equity loan, if you took out two home equity loans every year for the last 15 years, there's different payments for each and every one of those home equity loans, and those are, are stacked up here. The, um, the assumption changes are the purple, 
uh, bars and then the gain and loss, the actual gains and losses are the yellow bars and they're split, uh, split pretty evenly between the two. Um, so you can see over the, in the next five years, that's a pretty stable growth, uh, just slightly growth in the UAL payments. But then from 2028 down to 2036, you have a dramatic decline in those UAL payments. It goes from about $140 million down to zero within 10 years. And that's that's remarkably quick when you're looking at how that unfunded is being paid off. Oh, actually, one I did want to note one more thing. Um, so this is only showing the current amortization layers. If there's any future gains and losses that uh, obviously we don't know about yet, it would just shift that blue line up or down, depending on if it's a gain or loss. You're going to have that same overall trend because of how many bases there actually are currently in place. So now looking at uh, projections of the contributions. On the left side, we're showing the uh, projected contribution rates. And then on the right side, we're showing the uh, contribution dollar amounts. Um, to note on the left side, you can see the uh, contribution rate is currently at 77% for the city. And there's a slight downward tick over the next four years. As the net asset uh, gains over the last four years are going to be phased in, uh, there's a slight blip up, uh, up to 74%. And that blip there is due to um, the 2022 actuarial loss on the assets uh, fully being recognized. Um, but most importantly, you can you note that there's that similar downward quick trend of reducing the contribution rates, similar to how the reduction in the UAL uh, was showing. So um, again, very good news. Um, and then looking at the actual contribution amounts, uh, very similar trends. You do see slight upticks in the, the dollar amount of the contributions being paid, and that's because of those UAL payments as a dollar amount are expected to increase uh, with, in, with assumed inflation of 2.5%. But again, a very similar pattern here. We should just note that it's a uh, pretty, the pattern is very similar to 2021, but it's a significant change in the level. Uh, right. From what right. And, right. and that's due specifically to the asset loss in 2022. Um, if you looked at the 2020, 2020 projections though, right, you would see that that line would be much higher as well. So there was just two years where it was very volatile with those returns. So the the topic of the day, of, it always is, is the maturity of San Jose's pension plan. Um, the police and fire, this is showing the membership counts. Uh, back from 2003 to, up to the current day. And we did show this exact graph to you last time and there was much discussion on it. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time. I just wanna you know, set the stage that um, you have a very mature plans. And in terms of their, the number of inactives that the active population has to support, this is what this graph represents in the support ratio. Um, so since, uh, basically back in 2010 and 2011, the trend, uh, what happened with the active membership um, that declined dramatically, about 15% from about 2,000 actives to 1,700, but at that, and that has never recovered uh, in the active population since then, but, but at that same time frame, you see almost a doubling of the inactive membership. So, Again, just a very, uh, very mature plan um, in comparison to your peers as well. So quantitatively uh, looking at a measure of maturity are these leverage ratios. Um, and this is one of, the, we've been showing these for years. Um, I know Drew especially likes these graphs. So um, this is showing uh, the different sensitivities your plan has to investment volatility and assumptions. So on the left-hand side, we have the asset leverage ratio, which is simply the amount of assets on the market value basis divided by your pay active payroll. And then the liability leverage ratio is your 
plan's liability divided by your member payroll. Um, so what does that actually mean? And again, I, it means on the left-hand side, when we're looking at the ash, asset leverage ratio, we're looking at how sensitive your plan is to in, uh, investment volatility. Um, so what we're seeing here is San Jose's asset leverage ratio is the gold uh, diamonds. Um, and then we also have San Jose as a whole uh, as the black triangles. The bars uh, indicate the distribution of the national public plan database and all the different plans asset leverage ratios and the the public plan database is compiled of pension plans who typically have both their safety membership and their general membership in one system so that's why we're showing san jose as a whole here so it's more of an apples to apples comparison when we're looking at this um i think to note um Looking at 2010 and 2011, the jump in the the asset leverage ratio for police and fire from below 10 to almost 15 is due to that market decline in your active membership. So, um, oh, hey, this is true. I know I've asked them before. So that database might have say 5,000 plans in it. Are we the one? Um, well, there's actually, there's only about 200 plans okay. and I do think you're either number one or number two. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You're, you're not actually in the database. So we have to oh. add you to compare <laughs> to the database. Well, yeah, right. Because obviously the blue bars, the gold ones, I got that bill, but yeah. Right. Bill, would you agree with Ann? I mean, we are out there, right? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. You love these charts. They just, yeah. So, so this is city council when the time comes and basically wag your finger at them and say, shame on you for giving this burden to us. <laughs> Put that numerically, um, it may make a little bit more sense. If, if you had a, if there was a 10% loss, an actual loss on assets for two plans, um, and for your plan, a 10% loss, I don't mean you loot your return is a negative 10%. What I mean is a 10% loss from your expected return. So that would be about a negative 3% return. What that means is for your plan, let's say for San Jose Police and Fire Mix, I say it's around 10, the asset leverage ratio is 10. What that means is in translating it into uh, how it impacts, looks how it compares to your payroll, it would be about 100% of payroll. That loss would equate to about 100% of your payroll. However, looking at a less volatile plan, like the, the median is around six for the asset leverage ratio for these national systems, that same 10% actuarial loss would only equate to a 60% of their of the payroll. So it just it, it's just dramatically different for especially police and fire where we're looking at asset leverage ratios over 15. Um, so we're, I'll give an ex more examples on the next slide of what that means to your contribution rates. But then before we do that, I just want to touch base on the liability leverage ratio. Um, and this, again, measures the sensitivity of uh, changes in the plan's liability. Um, and what that means typically is changes in your actual assumptions and most notably changes in your discount rate. So you are above 20 on your liability leverage ratio. Um, just again, off the charts, sensitive to those types of changes. And if I may ask you a question before you move on. Um, by the way, I learn every time I've heard your presentations, I learn, I learn so much from than you guys. So sorry if I'm repeating some of this, but um, it, the asset leverage ratio is, it's obviously shockingly large for us, right? So is that, it, it's, I guess, intuitively, uh, it seems surprising to me that it, let me take, let me take a step back. So is that correlated to the, the maturity of the plan or the fact that we have so many fewer active members? Yes. And if so how come that, I mean, given San Jose is a thriving city, the economy around us is so strong. How come there are 200 other public plans that don't have similar maturity ratios? I'm just, it's not adding up. 
Okay, so well, part of that is is exactly what you said. It's because of that that drop that we had in the active membership, and it we've it's never regained. You're still at about seventeen hundred employees uh, compared to what you were ten years ago, but at the same time, your uh, retirees and inactive membership has doubled, and so it's it's also positive too. Your assets have grown, right? The 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 indicator is assets over payroll. So your assets have also grown, but your payroll in comparison has shrunk or has de declined. So that's why you're getting those large, you know, part of why you have such a large uh, asset leverage ratio. And again, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if your plan were 100% funded, that ratio would go up even more, right? Because you'd have even more assets in the plan. So um, I, I do think that 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 lack of recovery in your active member population is is really what is driving a lot of this. And, and let me just add, we the sensitivity goes both directions. Yes, so we used as the example a ten percent loss, but a ten percent gain where you got a sixteen and five eighths percent return would reduce. Uh, your UAL by 100% of payroll. And, and so your contribution rates would drop more quickly um, than other plans. And so that, that's part of uh, what, we've, what we saw last year was uh, with those great returns, we saw projections of very significant drops in, in contributions. And with the losses, then much of yeah. that dropped, although not all of it uh, was reversed. Yeah, understood. It goes both ways. But just let me one one, one follow up. So are you saying, I mean, would it be possible perhaps to see something where we can see the maturity of our plan versus, or combined San Jose, it doesn't matter if it's, sorry, versus these other 200 plans? Like, are we saying that 200 plans across the country are much less mature um, than us? Well, it's yeah. right. It's they're less mature, but it's also given the, the the assets that you do have in the plan. Your plan is close to eighty percent funded, which is higher than the national average as well. So the higher your ah okay your funding is, also you're more sensitive. Okay, point taken. Thanks. And on the liability leverage ratio, the discount rate does have an effect. Yes. So <laughs> this is Franco. I got a question. Of your this, other 200 plans, are they CalPERS? And if they are, are you looking at their individual plans or are they blended? That's blended, yeah. CalPERS is, treat, is one of the 200 plans. And um, so it, it's viewed in aggregate. Harvey? Question. Oh, hi, Bill. Thanks. Yeah, so this is, you know, uh, striking um, with on these, this slide. And so I'm wondering how should the board be informed or how should this inform the board's decision making? Translate this for the board as to what it means in terms of how the board goes forward in making decisions, whether actuarial decisions or investment decisions? Why should they care? So I can um, start to answer that question. And I think that these graphs have been presented to the board for the last at least five to 10, five years. And definitely a lot of the board's investment choices and decisions have been driven by the fact that they know that they're very sensitive to investment volatility. And there was a discussion earlier today where they were talking about um, decreasing the volatility or decreasing their beta, but trying to increase their alpha to mitigate that risk. So they have already put into place in their asset allocation and trying to mitigate this volatility and this sensitivity that they have to investment returns. Yeah, I think it led to the whole study by Veris about how much risk uh, could 
could this system afford? Um, because these metrics, these metrics are just based on the plan. It don't look at the sponsor's um, balance sheet or um, financial worthiness at all. Uh, so they're just based on on the the system. And so Veris took it to that next level to assess uh, what levels of risk um, would be appropriate for the plan. And, and I think, Anne, if you go through the next slide yeah. here. Yeah. Then well, let me just exemplify that for our newer members. So we did this uh, with Bill and Anne's help in Veris up three or four years ago. And we did the classic thing where we said, well, Let's do this in two steps. Bill alluded to this. First, grading on a curve. We are riskier than others. Therefore, we should have a lower discount rate, a lower actual portfolio, a less risky portfolio. And then as Bill said, then we said, Varys, okay, well, how much less? And that's where Varys said to us, you know, 50 basis points, something on that order would get you in the position where the reaction the city of San Jose would have to any particular market downturn would match its peers because you have a less risky portfolio than them. Go back to you, Ann. Okay, so this slide puts what we were talking about on the previous slide into actual numbers for uh, for the city and for the pension plan. On the left-hand side, we're looking at the impact of a discount rate change, which changes the liabilities um, would have on, this, on the contribution rates. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, we're showing the current 2022 valuation contribution of 76.5%. If the discount rate were decreased by 100 basis points or 1% at, down to 5.625, you would see the city's contribution increase to over 100%, about 102% of payroll. That's a huge jump. That's a 25% of pay increase. Um, now, of course, this is definitely just illustrative. Um, I don't know that any system who's ever decreased their discount rate by 100 basis points, but it's just showing um, what would happen to the contribution. Um, and it's also interesting to note here that every component of the contributions increases. You have increases in your normal cost rate. You have increases in your UAL. Um, and also, importantly, when you change your discount rate, the members rates also change because they're paying a percentage of the normal cost rate. So you see increases in the member rate as well. Then on the right hand side, um, this is showing the volatility of um, investment changes. Um, and what we're looking at here <clears throat> on the left, the very left side of the grid is um, the total city contribution rate for the 2022 valuation at 76.5. For next year, if the plan achieves its 6.625% return, we're expecting that rate to fall just a little bit, but to 74%. Um, but if there was a significant event, a two standard deviation event, a loss on the assets, which for your plan would be about a negative 20% rate of return, the contribution rate for the city would increase by almost 18%. Now, what's different than the discount rate impact is that all of the investment loss is a UAL uh, driver. It, it only affects the unfunded accrued liability. It doesn't impact the normal cost rate. So um, you see all of that is being, that increases on the interest on the UAL and then the UAL principal. Um, so to note too, um, the difference between these two graphs is that as you know, with the investment returns, those are phased in over a five-year period for your, based on your actual smoothing method, and the impact of your discount rates are immediate. So there is only a 20% of that loss that we're talking about, this two standard deviation loss on the right-hand side, is only 20% uh, rec is recognized in these numbers, so that you would see consistent um, increases as well for the next four years for a loss that size. And again, these are extreme events. They're only to really illustrate the impact so that you can kind of really see the magnitude of these uh, 
of what happens to the change in the contributions. Are there any questions? I know there's a lot of information on this slide. I just want to emphasize that this jump from 74.2 to 92.6 is with the asset smoothing. And so you would expect more jumps in the subsequent years uh, due to that investment loss, uh, depending on what investment returns were after that. So even with the smoothing, uh, that's an 18% of payroll increase in the city's contribution. Um, which would be quite significant. And, and of course, it works both ways. So um, it, it, going forward here, we, we also do our stochastic projections so that uh, we do 10,000 trials of investment returns and calculate what the, the contribution rates would be. And they're graphed in the- Hey, Bill, real quickly, um, that's historical returns or do you also include some forecast returns from Veris or Makita? These are forecasted based on Makita's capital market assumptions. So okay. uh, we, right. we use the assumed return as the expected return and the standard deviation of 13.3% to forecast these returns. Um, the darker areas are the more common results as it spreads out to the lighter areas. Uh, those are less common. Um, but the constant refrain we've had here is, is that even out like five years, uh, the range of your contribution rates is extremely wide from somewhere around 20% to 120% of payroll, depending on whether you have good returns or bad returns. Um, there is definitely after the, the next five years, that strong downward trend that Anne was talking about. Uh, and, and that's just because of the fixed nature of our amortization schedule. But there's um, a range of outcomes around that. Uh, so contribution rates could remain uh, remain quite high or even higher than they are now. Here we, we're showing the same uh, stochastic projections, but as dollar amounts and split between tier one and tier two. And, and we put them on the same scale so that you can compare them. And you can see that it's all about tier one. Uh, tier two, we, we've talked about the maturity of the plan, but tier two is very immature. It's very young and growing. And so it's very difficult uh, to get huge swings in, in the contribution amounts for it because uh, because it's so small right now, uh, the liabilities are are just building, uh, no retirees right now, so the all of the uh, risk and volatility and size is still in the tier one uh, plan and projections. Uh, in addition to contribution rates, there uh, the UAL uh, fluctuates significantly, uh, and that there is this uh, a negative number here is a surplus. That means you're greater than a hundred percent funded. Uh, the positive is, is the higher UALs. Uh, we show the projection is for it to steadily decline to get down to to zero. Uh, but there's a huge uh, range around that based on investment returns. Uh, on the right-hand side, we're showing the, the probability uh, where we are now of um, being funded 80% or higher uh, in the blue bars or 100% or higher in the green bars. So last year, there was a lot higher probability of reaching 100% funded. Um, but there's still a probability, uh, a small one, of reaching it in a short period of time. Uh, 
out at 2036, uh, we approach about a 50% probability given our current assumptions. So, so Bill, you said in the past, and, and I've read in the literature that your peers agree with you that your target really isn't 100% funded. Your target's somewhere in the 90s. And they sort of say, well, good enough, and the, and the rest is kind of slop. If, the, is, if that's true, then this says we should get to that target sometime around 2028. Am I reading this right? So I don't think we'd say that your target is really 90. It's as you approach 90 plus and 100, there are different issues to think about in terms of how you fund and invest the plan. Uh, this chart assumes you make no changes at all. And clearly, if we were on the track towards creating an $8 billion surplus, we would be making some changes. Uh, there, there's less reason to take investment risk if we are more than 100% funded. And so we'd start looking at uh, different alternatives and different ways of approaching it, uh, whether that's matching some of our liabilities or um, switching to more fixed income or whatnot. We'd have to go through a whole analysis to figure out exactly what to do. Um, but that's what we were talking about is that whole dynamic. We've been focused on getting up there. And, and so the investment returns needed and the contributions needed uh, to get up there are a different approach than trying to stay there once we've arrived. And so that's a relatively new concept, right? Bill? Because we go back 15 or 16 charts, you showed the historical universe of percent funder ratio. And, and back in I don't know, 2004 or five, there were plenty of plans that were 100% plus, but they did, we were, and we didn't need risk. When I stepped into this stupid plan, I think our discount rate was still 8%. It, yeah, that's right. And there's, been a lot of learnings from what uh, we went through in, in that time period. And uh, I'm working with a group at the Academy of Actuaries. We're about to publish an issue brief on uh, surplus and what to consider. Uh, because the experience was um, plans did two things. One, they improved benefits. And two, they reduced contributions, sometimes all the way to zero. Uh, and it proved very difficult to uh, increase those contributions from zero to get them back up when, when the market turned. And the, sometimes the benefits that were improved, sometimes you need to improve the benefits, but sometimes those benefit improvements uh, proved very costly because you cannot reverse them uh, once you've granted those benefit improvements. Uh, so I think, our, uh, our issue brief talks about being cautious about both reducing contributions too far. You've put in a floor at, uh, or the city put in a floor at normal cost so that we will at least keep a budget item for it. Uh, and, and really doing some analysis on, on benefit improvements, but putting perhaps at the top of the list, um, considering reducing the risks that the plan is taking and using the surplus, any surplus to help mitigate those risks. Hey, great. Hey, Bill, make sure you send us a copy of that brief when it comes out. I'd love to read it. Sure will. Um, so those stochastic charts we know are kind of hot, hard to absorb for a lot of people. Uh, and so we wanted to illustrate a couple scenarios uh, for you. And uh, so we just created uh, some positive and negative scenarios, a one-year shock scenario, where we basically take the fifth percentile and 95th percentile returns from the distribution over a one-year period. Uh, and, oops. And then for a five-year scenario, we take the 25th and 75th percentile returns and just assume those roll out. So these are obviously not realistic scenarios. They're not intended to be realistic economic scenarios. But to give you a sense of how the asset smoothing and different 
uh, policy methods play out and the volatility of contributions uh, under those scenarios. So if we look at that on the left, we have the city's aggregate contribution rates. And you can see that that one year shock, um, not unlike Anne's uh, chart showing the one year minus 20% return, sends contributions up quite significantly uh, before they start coming down. And, and the positive shock sends the contributions uh, plummeting very quickly compared to the baseline. And those five-year um, moderate scenarios uh, still have a pretty significant effect uh, on contributions. There is, um, because of our amortization uh, periods, that overall downward uh, decline. Uh, but that's also because these scenarios you know, only go out one or five years so, and then assume we get the assumed rates of return. But that gives you a sense of that, that volatility. The difference in that one year shock uh, of a peak return or peak contribution rate over 100% of pay, or if it went the other way, dropping all the way to 40% of pay, cutting the contribution in half um, in just a few years, in, in five years. Uh, and, and so you see similar things here. Now, we also show the impact on tier two member contribution rates. The city pays the same rate as the member for tier two, and they're splitting the UAL cost. Before you freak out by how wide the, the lines are, please note that we blew up the y-axis here. So while on the left, these range from about 15% of pay to over 100% of pay, here we're talking about a range from 14 and a half uh, to 16 and a quarter. So it's a very narrow uh, range by comparison, uh, but there is still volatility uh, on the, the member contribution side. Uh, we, they're currently over 100% funded. And so the, um, we do offset the cost of administrative expenses uh, with that overfunding. Uh, and, and so over time, uh, we expect that to wear away so that we get back up to a, a normal cost that's about 15.3%. Uh, if we have good returns, all, all we are doing is paying all of the administrative expenses. And so then it's the, the shock on the, the negative side that, that has an impact. But those are really pretty moderate impacts because the, the plan is so young and, and growing. Um, so we, we are not seeing the risk of significant changes in tier two member contribution rates yet. That's something that will um, evolve over time as tier two gets more mature. And then the final thing we wanted to leave you with is uh, just a, a tool so that you can refer to this based on what investment returns are during the year to get a sense of, of what would happen to the next year's uh, contributions. So the, the blue line on the left is the, um, the fiscal year 2024 city contribution and or city rate on the right hand side. And the green line is what the following year, the 2025 contribution would be under uh, investment returns that are shown on the x-axis from minus 15 to plus 30%. So if we get our assumed rate of return, we expect the dollar amount to remain about the same for the city's contribution. We expect the percent of pay of that contribution to drop from 76.5 to 74.2. In fact, as long as we get a return better than minus 1%, we'd expect the city contribution rate to uh, go down. But you can see if you got, if you had the minus 15% return, the city's contribution rate would shoot up to about 84% and 234 million. On the flip side, if you got a 30% return, 
the city's contribution would drop to 188 million or about 67% of payroll. So it gives you a sense what happens in that one year and uh, where the contributions are going. So with that, any questions? Yeah, hi, Bill, this is Howard. Thank you, and Anne, for the, uh, this is a very useful presentation as usual. I just, the question you, I had a question about the 74.2%. Is that based on the prior slides uh, baseline? Or is that just a decreasing, an uh, increasing return calculation? Uh, it, no, it, well, it is based on the, the baseline scenario. But what, what's going on there is we're expecting payroll to grow and the dollar amount of the contribution not to change. And so that makes the, the percent of payroll go down. Oh, okay. Okay, so, and then that number 74.2 is, is right around between five and 10% return? It's uh, six and five eighths percent return. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. All right, great. And that, the other question I had was in the report, uh, and maybe this is more a general question, on, in the report on page 12, it talks about uh, the three principal risks, investment risk, uh, interest rate risk, and assumption change risk. I mean, I, I, we've seen the, the, the impact of a dramatic change in discount rate, but at this point in time, uh, is there one risk that's greater than the other among the three? Well, that depends on your projection for the economy, I guess. <laughs> uh, I think the one we are definitely affected with each year is investment returns. Uh, but one thing we talked about with when we set the assumptions is with the rise in interest rates, it's really changed capital market assumptions. And so that risk um, could really work in our, our favor if those interest rates remain at a higher higher levels, um, but you know, I think we have the the ongoing risk uh, longer term that those interest rates come back down uh, and affect our capital market assumptions that way. Um, I don't see other than the the discount rate, and I'll, I'll let Ann chime in if she sees something else. Other than the discount rate. I don't see significant assumption change risks out there. The um, there's been a lot of talk about mortality, uh, especially with COVID, and whether what that long term impact is. Um, but what we've seen so far is that the impact on the pension plan has been very minor. Um, so I guess I'm not really seeing huge uh, assumption change risks. Right. And yeah, I'll piggyback on that, Bill, um, uh, with other assumptions like retirements and terminations. There was so much um, volatility during COVID with, with retirements and people leaving the systems. Um, and I've done a few experience studies in the last couple months here. And even with those dramatic changes, they didn't, you know, they didn't really impact, if you look at the last six years, they didn't really impact the trends over the last six to nine years. So, and, and even when you're looking at what happened in each valuation, looking at the gains and losses of more terminations or less, or more retirements in one year, significant fluctuations in those didn't impact the liabilities that much. Um, in comparison to what your investment returns look like. So that assumption risk, I think, because we can really hone in on those assumptions and those liability losses uh, from those are very, or gains, are just very minimal in comparison. So that risk is there, but it's just very small compared. I think the, the one that we are watching shorter term are salary increases um, because of inflation. Uh, and that uh, that could have an effect, but it it's so tied to the higher interest rates, which are also uh, linked not directly, but, but linked to inflation. 
Um, so those, I view those more as, as offsetting. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Ann and Bill. Uh, Harvey, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, just one quick question for the board on slide 12. That's the leverage ratios. Just to see if you could flip back to that. So, there we go. So, these leverage ratios, which we took some time to go through, and I thank you for that, um, are based on active payroll. And I'm wondering whether it might be informative to the board to um, split active payroll into active tier one payroll and active tier two payroll and see how the ratios work, you know, as if they were, for illustrative purposes, if they were two separate plans. You know, the liabilities, what would be the ratios on the li liability leverage, particularly if it was just based on the liabilities of tier one and the payroll of tier one, since we know that tier two has, you know, no unfunded <laughs> liability at all. Um, would, would that be useful, you think, for the board to, to in terms of risk analysis to, well, I guess the, the, I deposit, the, the, the issue might be, can we take more or less risk with our assets if we know that they relate more or less to tier one liabilities and tier one payroll. Does that make any sense? I, I may be not saying it quite so well, but it seems right. to me there's some, some difference there between tier one and tier two that might be informative for the board. It, it, there is a big difference there. And so teasing them apart uh, is useful for understanding that difference and, and seeing that you know the tier two is not sensitive and tier one is extremely sensitive. Um, the advantage of putting them together it, is it gives you a better sense of the overall impact to the city. And, and really when you're looking at whether the the risk levels are affordable and what risk level to set, it, it's really, can the city afford the whole package? And what's the impact on our contribution rates for the, the whole package and that that sensitivity? So, it, um, so, so there can be uses for both. I think here, it, and particularly, it, um, when I talk about this more broadly, it, it talk about payroll being a proxy for the sponsor's revenues. Uh, and when you're dealing with large state plans that have a whole bunch of different employers, we can't track down exactly what revenues are, are appropriate. And so payroll becomes kind of a good proxy for the resources available to fund the plan. And, um, so I think that that concept still holds here, but that is also why Veris took it the next step to really look at the the city's revenues and and what the city actually could afford. Okay. I guess if I were a tier two member, I might have a question like, why are you taking risk with my assets? If we're 100 funded for tier two liabilities, right? I think that there is um, over time there is a significant question about how uh, tier two should be funded, how the investment should work for tier two versus tier one. And those dynamics are going to change over time as tier one uh, gets more and more mature uh, and, and really functions as a closed tier. It, that dynamic is going to change for tier one. Uh, similarly, for tier two, as it gets uh, more mature and you have to uh, balance those risks because the employees are going to pay a portion of the, the cost of any losses, 
I, I think that dynamic is going to change. So it, it is an important question to keep an eye on. Uh, we're just very early in that transition in terms of making any any decisions on it. So let me answer that differently, um, Harvey. I'm sure you'll agree, Bill. So if you hand me a hundred bucks and tell me to throw it, um, um, two questions. How long now? And along the way, do I need to do anything with it? And if you say 50 years and you don't need to do anything with it, I'm just in the stock market. I will stick it in the riskiest asset class because over 50 years, the market is always the best. <laughs> hey, Tiano, do 15 years and every second or third year, I'm going to come to you and ask for 10% of it. Then the individual volatility per year matters. Right, Harvey, you know, it's up 3%, down 1%, up 5%, down 2%. Yeah, I'm in trouble in a down 2% year. But if it's up, if it, if it seesaws like that in 50 years, it's up 20%, right, Bill? That's part of Harvey's answer, too. Yeah, I, I guess I think it comes down to, to this chart. Uh, you know, if if tier two had, had the width <laughs> of tier one, uh, we'd have serious problems. So we would really want to look at it uh, long before we get to the position where where tier one is in terms of that range of potential contribution amounts. But give, given where we are, that range is really uh, very tiny, uh, even out. 15, 16 years. So it, it's something that we probably don't have to address directly uh, for another 10 years, but we will need to address it. And, and so the question is, at what point do we um, start addressing it and consider changes? Uh, I think when we've looked at it now, the, the issues with tier one just overwhelm the whole uh, discussion and that's really where the the focus uh, needs to be right now is on managing tier one. Uh, we have we have time to to address tier two, uh, and, and we'll see how that that evolves. It is something we need to monitor. Well, and so now you recall on this chart, I asked Bill a question: What was he using as his base data for the Monte Carlo analysis? And so Bill turned to you and said, well, I use post-depression actual historicals. You'd see a very, very different chart here. Right, Bill? You are not sequencing the Monte Carlo draws. You are randomly drawing per year. But of course, that's not right either because market yes. cycles, right? So it deeply matters what data you're using and whether you're using individual year draws or decadal or even um, um, quad century draws. Does that make sense, Bill? Uh, yeah, you're pointing to, um, we're using individual year draws. So there- And forward, and you're using forward forecasts too. Forward, forward forecasts. And so if oh. anything, we should be showing uh, a wider distribution than more sophisticated models would. Um, and, but, but I think the difference over short time periods is, is not significant. It's when you look out 20, 30 years, you start seeing some significant differences. Yeah, so that's, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, I just, it, it, on the headcount issue, it, or when we should, when it is right for this board to start thinking about the future of tier two, I, my understanding is, is that we're up to about 40% of active payroll is now tier two. So I'm wondering, you know, I'm just putting out there the thought that maybe some early planning, as you would say for your child for college, uh, might be worth the, the board's attention sooner than later. Yeah, that's a good point, Harvey. You know, if, if and I do with my own kids, you know, the six months old, 
stick in the stock market. They're not going to need it for 18 years. But as you say, it's it's as we look at the population and say, you know, the first of these tier two guys are going to start retiring in five years, right? Then all of a sudden we 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 crank that back, which is actually what I did with my kids' portfolio until a point when they got in college, I was sitting in muni bonds, right? Because they're going to need next year. Um, so yeah, rest of the trustees, you don't have to know Monte Carlo or anything else. It's inside baseball. Shakespeare famously said in Hamlet that some must watch while some must sleep. Um, just to let you know, at least one of us is is on the watchtower watching. That's what, kind of all you need to know. So uh, Harvey's right that about 40% of the active payroll is, is tier two. Uh, the flip side of that is the liability is only about 100 million compared to 5.6 billion. So um, it, it is a timing question of when you start to address it. We've got 40% of the payroll, but they all have very short service, uh, very uh, low liabilities that are deferred into the future. So it it is sort of that that timing question of when, when you start addressing it. But right, for the next several years, the big issue is, is managing tier one. Um, that's not to say you should lose track of the separate issues for tier two. So, you know, or just look at the next section, you got 21 people retiring and just a quick glance, the median years in service appears to be somewhere between 25 and 30. And when do we fire up a, uh, Franco, uh, Andrew, when do we fire up tier two, 2014, 2013? It was 14. Yeah. Right. So uh, based on that, we've got about two decades more before the front end of the wave of actually paying out starts to hit. And Harvey, if you were to do a Monte Carlo simulation based on actual, what well, you would do Monte Carlo, here's actual historical data, looking at returns for over 20 years starting in um, 46, 47, 1948, 1949, um, those returns are all positive, and the riskier you set the dial, the higher the median return, and it's never negative, right? And it may, you know, the stupid thing in Peru today is Harvey, if you, it matters deeply when the first year is 55, if the first year is in a recession, it matters deeply the 20 year return. And if the first couple of years are in a boom period, I mean, it'll, it'll end up over 20 years like doubling what you get. So, uh, but you're right, Harvey. To me, we, you know, that's a good point, Bill. Let, let's put on our, our thinking caps for a future meeting. Have a brief discussion to send to future boards in a time capsule. Uh, this is the year you ought to wake up and start looking at this. I have a question. Sure. Um, by the way, I really thought this was uh, very helpful, the stochastic analysis. On page 17, I'm not trying to oversimplify this, but I, as, a, as a trustee, I'm trying to do a takeaway from the slide. So are we essentially saying that um, the probability of getting to 100% funding, you know, is over the next, uh, I don't know, the, like, like Drew said, over perhaps my foreseeable term in the, in, on this board uh, is, is really low. And so we're essentially, uh, are, are, to get to an 80% target, our main lever is, is risk, right? Because uh, our asset allocation is, I mean, I'm just trying to see how, how do I take this and say this is, we should do better on, or we can get, uh, increase the probability of getting to 80% uh, by taking more risk. Is that the lever to move? So, so let me pick up the front end of this. So when I see this chart, I see that the probability of getting to 100% hits 50%, which is what we want. Because half the time, I'll overshoot and be 105% funded, and half the time, I'll undershoot, right? Bill, your target is to get us to 100% funded, not 105 or 95, right? 
Right. Our target is to get you to 100%. So this kind of confirms that we are targeting 100% because you've got the 50 50 uh, chance uh, built in. If you want to get there faster, uh, you either have to get better investment returns or uh, contribute more. <laughs> or, uh, you know, the other thing that would get us there faster is if we change our, if we increase the discount rate, but that's just assuming we can get better investment returns. So these are assuming six and five eights uh, as the, the median return. Okay. Bill, uh, let me let me, uh, let me jump on top of your questions. Too. So, all right, Bill, and then put your thinking caps on and put you on the spot. So, let's say ninety percent is a good target, and I want the one sigma seventy percent, sixty-five percent probability of hitting it. What does this chart do, Bill? If I crank my discount rate up to seven percent and my actual returns to match that, can you roughly guess off the top of your head? Does that give us a one sigma chance of getting to 90% in 2036? Anne already knows the answer, but you got to think faster. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's, there's two aspects going on. If we change the discount rate to 7%, it, it would immediately increase our funded ratio to about 84% from 78. So, um, so that part helps. But then our funding mechanism would reduce contributions as well. So, you know, if you looked out at 2036, you'd still see the 50-50. What you'd see different is in the intervening years, it, it would be a higher probability. But 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 this shows that in 2036, we have a 70% chance of being 80% or higher. Probably reasonable to assume that if we were to raise the discount rate in the actual return to 7%, we'd have a 70% or higher chance of getting to 90% or better funded. Fair, fair comment? Yeah, something along the, those lines, yes. So, so to the extent that we might say our goal within a 15 year stretch of time is to be at a one sigma certainty of being 90% or better, we could do that just by raising our discount rate. Well, it, I mean, that and our actual return match. that presumes, yeah, that raising your discount rate is a reasonable approximation of what you expect returns to be. Well, yeah, and we're gonna get in a uh, uh, real Donnie Brook, you and Ann and I and the board when we talk about um, adding alpha to our discount rate. Bill's already let us know that um, actuaries have a serious heartburn issue, with in, including alpha in discount rate, which you should, Bill. However, our job is to prove to you that our formula generates consistent, sustainable, profitable alpha, which we can do, assuming we can maintain our current staff and Prabhu, which is why we're going after incentive compensation. So Sunita, you're, everything, it's very holistic. All of this ties together, right? This whole thing, you know, this goes back to audit, you guys. It goes back to investment committee. It goes back to JPC, right? If our goal, and well, they actually say, look, we're setting all the knobs. So you get to, you know, if there's a chance to get to 100%, in some smoothing period, 15 years, right? Our job is, well, as Bill says, okay, how do we turn the, the sub knobs along the way to make that journey more probable um, and easier for the city, easier for us, easier for the city. Is that fair to say, Bill? Yeah, I think so. Uh, are you, uh, floor's open, right, Bill? You're you're ready it is. to move. On. We are done. Questions are asked. Any more questions from anybody? Bill, go ahead. Take us into OPEB. Uh, we do need an action on this. Yeah, one. we do need action from the board, Mr. Chair. Yeah, on the agenda. 
Uh, did, 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 uh, so what? What are we? What are we actually voting on, Bill? That we accept this? It, accepting the report, I think, it, yeah. is what we need. Do I have a motion that we will accept uh, this report? So move, Santos. I have a motion second. by Santos. I have a second by Sunita. Let's go around. Uh, Andrew. Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Schwar. Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. I'm, I'm Drew, Drew and I vote aye. I'm enormously proud of this board and actually myself too. I think this is the first year I actually understood every piece of this, Bill and Ann. <laughs> and that's not me, that's you guys. God bless you, Bill and Ann, for sticking with us knuckleheads. Um, I get this now, and that's because you guys do such a great job every year of explaining it. And you can see me as laugh as you like, I'm not there yet, Drew, but I'm twice as far as I was last year. Good for you, Sunita. You stay with it, you'll get there. It only took me 10 years. Uh, on to OPEB. All right, let me uh, bring the OPEB presentation up. And uh, for this presentation, I have Mike Shunning with me to, uh, he's our healthcare actuary uh, to help present the preliminary evaluation results. So this will be a much shorter presentation, much less detail. Good to have you here, Mike, over to you. So um, just wanted to remind you the explicit subsidy part of the um, OPEB plan, that's the, the retiree healthcare premium subsidy uh, is funded in a similar manner to the pension plan. The difference, one key difference is there are actually two pots of money. There's a 401H account that's in the pension trust and that's where the member contributions go. And then there's the 115 trust, which is where the city contributions go. Uh, the benefits have been being paid out of the 401H account. Uh, so it, it's uh, very small amounts left in the 401H account. And in fact, for fire, there, there's really uh, virtually nothing left. So the, except for what's new and coming in. Uh, so we do manage across these two different uh, accounts, um, but uh, otherwise it's very similar to the funding mechanisms for, for the pension plan. Uh, our valuation setting contributions for fiscal year 2024, um, the, the other key difference is we only set the contributions for the city. The member contributions are fixed in the, the municipal code. So for uh, police, again, it's, this is a very similar chart to what we used on the pension where the, the blue is the liability for those in pay status, the red for the active and the, the gold for people who've who are no longer working for the city, but are entitled to a future benefit. Um, the, we only track the market value of assets for these plans. So there is no actuarial value. And uh, you'll see, even based on the market value, the funded ratios just dropped slightly this year from 41 to about 40 for uh, police and from 38 to 37. Uh, for fire. Uh, the other thing I want to note is uh, we've been talking about the pension plan where the liability was 5.6 billion. Uh, the top of our scale here is only 500 million. So it's a much smaller overall liability. The contributions we're projecting in the preliminary results uh, or the member contributions going down, uh, that's mainly because the, the member population who's eligible for full benefits is going down. Uh, the city contribution is uh, 
going up, but very slightly. It's about the same as the prior year and, and actually very close to our uh, projections. So unlike the pension plan, uh, these contributions are, are staying very close to prior projections. Just looking at the uh, membership, you can see we've had about a 9% drop in the active members who are eligible for full benefits. So only tier one members who did not elect to go into the VEBA get benefits under this plan. Uh, those who went, who elected the VEBA and new members are eligible for a catastrophic disability benefit but it is a substantially smaller uh, benefit. So here the active members are uh, that are eligible for the large benefit are declining. And uh, so we're shifting to a more and more mature uh, system with members in pay status. Uh, these are the, the detailed numbers behind those charts. I think the, the thing I wanted to point out on this chart that uh, you couldn't really see uh, on the original chart without the numbers is how close the unfunded actuarial liability is uh, from last year to this year. Uh, it's about 259 million for the police department and about 158 million for the fire department. Uh, and there's been very little change uh, in the last year. So it's it's really due to the the liabilities uh, went down as the investment returns went down. And so I'll turn it to Mike. He'll go through that in more detail. Yes, good morning. So you know, as Bill said, the overall UIL went up by about a million dollars. And essentially, we had liability reductions of about $58 million, a lot of which is due to premiums not going up as much as we expected them to, and due to the contributions in relationship to the tread water amount, which is the amount needed to kind of keep the unfunded liability unchanged. Then that was offset by the loss due to the investment losses in this year and the fact that there was an increase due to the, some of the assumption changes, and that's mainly the trend assumptions that went up a little bit because long-term inflation assumptions went up. So everything kind of balanced itself out, and we're basically in the same position now as we were last year, even though investments went down by quite a bit between the two periods of time. And then on the next page, it shows what's happened over the last five years. And again, as opposed to the pension plan, you have a lot more volatility on the liability side because of premiums and trends. And so we actually, just due to experience, mainly because premiums have been tracking lower than expected, the overall liability dropped by almost $163 million. And then we also had a slight gain because of the introduction of the new in lieu program and some of the VIPA transfers and members who could have been eligible for the the benefits under this plan, but elected to join the VIBA plan instead. But then again, that was offset due to the tread water amount contributions being slightly different from actual. Interestingly, investment losses were only actually a $21 million loss over this five-year period. And then we had $141 million loss due to assumption changes. And this is primarily due to the reduction in the discount rates that have happened to get it down to 6%. So you get over five years, it's like we're looking at it, you know, only a $6.7 million increase in the UIL over a five-year period. And then the next slide shows really where your liability is coming from. And then you notice in the really dark blue on the left that almost half the liability is due to members actually in pay status right now that are Medicare eligible. And if we add in kind of the future actives and their kind of Medicare eligible piece of their liability, over 65% of the costs really are due to the benefits that you end up paying for people when they're in the Medicare eligibility period. So they're older than age 65. Only about a quarter of it's to the benefits before that, and about 8% is due to the dental. So everything really hinges a lot on what happens to the Medicare 
premiums under the plan. And then the next page really shows the contributions, both the explicit, which is what's really being funded to the trust, and then the, that implicit piece, which is the difference between the premiums that are actually paid versus what the expected claims are. And that happens because the premiums are blended between the actives and the retirees. And so if, if you had actually rated the retirees on their own, the premiums would be much higher. And if anyone actually wants to get an idea of what that looks like, is because now under the VIVA plan, you do have members that are actually starting to get benefits. The city actually has negotiated retiree only rates for those members. And you can see that real difference play out as to if you rated them separately, you can see how much more expensive those premiums would be. But we see that again, as Bill is saying, because this is a closed group, as members retire, the amount of members are actually contributing to the plan continues to decrease. So that contribution amount is actually down by almost 7%. The city's contribution is actually up slightly, you know, basically less than a percent or about a percent for police and about half a percent for fire. And this, again, last year, the total contributions developed were actually slightly above the city's optional cap of 14%. And now it's actually slightly below the cap. So that while the overall contribution went up by $217,000 between the two plans, the city cap actually went up by more than that. So we kind of flipped the other way. So the actual contributions are now below the city's cap. And then again, we see the implicit subsidy increases. And we're going to con continue to see that kind of on a leveraged basis, because mm -hmm. as more and more people retire and they move from the retirement status into being over 65, where there's no more implicit subsidy, then you've got more and more actives under the plan. So that kind of tends to depress the rates a little bit, which is to the advantage of the, the actual liability of the plan. But then it means you've got less people that are retirees under the age of 65. Therefore, that implicit subsidy value continues to increase. So we'll kind of see that go up, but that really doesn't impact anything other than the financial reporting of the plan since those costs are actually funded every single year by the active premiums anyways. And with that, we can take any questions. Thanks, Mike. Floor is open. Any questions on OPEB? That's great, Mike. It's so, straight, <laughs> so straightforward. You answer all our questions. I'll entertain a motion to accept this. So moved by Mr. Chairman, Chairman we, uh, this is just for discussion purposes, no action by the board at this meeting. You sure? Right. Uh, hang on, Harvey. Hang on. <laughs> hang on. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. This is just the pre You're right. You're right. Thank you, Harvey. I read that. Um, all right. Great. Uh, any final questions for uh, Mike or Ann or uh, our friend Bill? Well, only only that bill is ready to discuss with the board whenever the board is ready to start addressing the differences between tier one and tier two. Just make sure you don't go away and stay around so we can have the discussions later down the road. <laughs> so, so I'll pat myself on the back. So part of the reason this board is lucky to have me is I think VCs, we invest in a company and maybe get our money out in 12 or 13 years. How hard to tell you this. So VCs have no problems thinking, yeah, I got to do that in about a decade. Right? So, yeah, we, I, Harvey, great suggestion. I won't lose that thread. I'll put my calendar for, uh, I don't know, 2030 to bring it up. And I'm not kidding. I will do that. And I will bring it up in 2030. I'm still alive and I'm still here. So... Uh, great stuff. Uh, over to you for 4E, Roberto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, thank you, Kyra. Much appreciate a very good discussion. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Um, we are recommending and asking you board approval to authorize uh, the CEO to execute the third amendment of the agreement with Cortex uh, for the current year 2023. Cortex is still providing services to your board. This is uh, for up to an additional $30,000. Doesn't mean that all the uh, funds have to be expanded. But as you know, there are 
at the very least, uh, very much involved on uh, the current JPC discussion uh, on various issues, including uh, compensation and incentive uh, plan, um, and also the annual performance evaluation of so the CEO and the CIO. So they will continue working with the board on those uh, annual uh, performances reviews. But also, you may recall that they work with you board and your uh, biannual self-assessment as a board, which actually comes to your board for 2023. So um, I am recommending uh, approval for this extension for another 12 months for Canada 2023 for up to $30,000. And I'm happy to address uh, any issues or questions. Uh, floor is open. Any questions for Roberto? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Along with Votto and others, I serve on that governor's committee and I love Tom Anucci, but can uh, I'll support if you tell me that 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 increase brings that much value to that cortex. Uh, I don't see it myself, but if y'all do, I got no problem. Uh, I, you know, actually, I can answer that. Maybe Andrew um, or sure can jump in. They're driving this new performance review process we did for the first time this past year. I'm very, very pleased with it. And we're still in the in the part of the cycle, Dick, where they're designing it and putting in a lot of work to take our feedback uh, from the first year. Am, am I missing something? Is that where you think this is coming from, Roberto? Well, if you tell yeah. me it's worth, if it's worth 130000 but I, I don't see it. When I'm on that committee, I'll tell you something. You got to keep yeah. toothpicks and keep your eyes open. Huh. Well, sure. that's what I'm saying, Dick. I think most of the work they did last year was for the Joint Personnel Committee. Jump in, Roberto. Yeah, no, I, I think I think Dick is, is to an extent correct. Um, they're not really doing that much governance work, per se, Dick, with the governance committee. This work that they've been uh, performing lately is more related to the JPC and the annual performance reviews of the CEO and CIO. Uh, there's still some work to be completed there. Uh, I'll, I, I'll defer to trustees that are um, actually involved in that, including the chair and the vice chair on the work, not only for the compensation, but the actual annual review process. So they still have to do some work on that. And then the second one, again, is view biannual self-assessment. So they're not working, you're correct, they're not doing work with the governance committee anymore. They're more working with the JPC and other areas of your board. So that's probably what you don't see them as much. The second comment I was going to make is the $130,000 is cumulative, uh, Dick, is what we're asking is for an additional $30,000 uh, because the first two amendments have brought the total of the contract to $100,000 um, that actually expires December 31st, 2022. This is just for an additional $30,000. And as I said, um, it will be all expended if they provide such services that will require the expense of the full $30,000. There's always a chance that is not the case. Hopefully that answers your question. Like I say, there's days that I could watch paint dry. It takes too long. <laughs> I, I understand it. If Roberto, you know, he has to do all the work and I'm always been there to be supportive. I just question things. Uh, I'm not against it. I'm just trying to understand it. So yeah. I no problem. Well, yeah, I, I'd like to see this bill, just speaking as a member of the Joint Personnel Committee. Um, I liked doing Roberto's <laughs> performance review along with Spencer, the chair of Federated, uh, using the guidelines from Cortex. Spencer, the chair of Federated, is actually driving the feedback loop. Um, 80, 90% was great and better than what we had before. And of course, 10, 20% we need to fix. And uh, he did, I'll tell you, Dick, he published, God, 100 pages. Was, look, I mean, I've been, I, I've been chairing compensation committees for two, three decades now. This is some of the best compensation review work I've ever seen. Of course, that's what we asked them to do. Um, that's not cheap. So any other questions? I'll uh, take the most. Go ahead. Sorry, Jim. Yeah. Question. So, hey, hey, Roberto, the uh, the the original was $100,000. Is the additional amount because the scope of the project increased? 
uh, during that time? So good question. No, no, the original was uh, was not hundred thousand. This is the third member amendment. So I believe the original uh, was um, it may have been forty thousand dollars, and then the first amendment another thirty. The second amendment another thirty. That makes it two hundred. This being the third amendment is another thirty thousand dollars for a total hundred and thirty. So. This is the third amendment after the first contract is being ongoing for about four years. Mm -hmm. They have been working on various issues. Uh, although the last couple of years have been mostly on the uh, board self-assessment and helping the uh, JPC uh, develop the, uh, the new annual uh, review process for the CEO and CAO with the, with the metrics. Okay. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Great. Uh, floor is still open. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve this. Motion to approve, Wilson. We got one from Wilson. Do I have a second? Second, Gardner. We got a motion from Wilson, second by Edmund. Let's go around. Andrew. Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Anita. Aye. Howard? Yes. Ashwar? Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. Um, Chair Lanza, I vote aye as well. Um, Harvey, what do we do now? Um, I'm on to item um, 4F for elections. What's the process here? Well, we at the last meeting, we had nominations. The nominations were closed. We have a nomination of, uh, as I recall, uh, Chair Lanza to repeat um, as board chair for next year. And I believe uh, Trustee Vado for vice chair, if I have that correctly. Those were the nominations. And uh, so today will be the vote um, under the board charter. An election policy. So the vote, the vote then, Harvey, is basically a count of aye or nay, right? That's correct. And we'll take them each one at a time. Chair okay. and vice chair. Great. I got that. That's what I was counting. All right. So let's do um, me chair first. Uh, do you want me to stand for your not? Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, David, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Sinita, how do you vote? Aye. Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Eshwar, how do you vote? Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. I'm Chair Lanz. I'll vote for myself, too. I feel like the prettiest girl at the ball. You ain't, Franco. Your turn's coming up. Let's <laughs> Franco Wilder for Vice Chair. Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. David? Aye. Sunita? Aye. Howard? Yes. Eshwar? Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. I'm Chair Lanza, but I, we got to get together, Franco, and compare corsages soon. Uh, that's great. Um, I guess, Harvey, I, you said Maytac uh, is preparing for a court case. Over to you, Harvey, for the uh, 361 show. Thank you. You have uh, before the board uh, a memorandum explaining the current status of the um, governor's no, 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 no. declaration and the most recent resolution of the city council of November 15th, uh, again, continuing the state of emergency uh, recognition of the impact of the ability of the boards to get together. So what uh, uh, I would uh, recommend the chair entertain a motion to make the factual findings set forth in the memorandum and for the board to elect for the next 30 days uh, to continue to operate under the uh, teleconference rules set forth in Assembly Bill 361. So moved by Santos. Great. Dick is moved to accept those two recommendations. Uh, do I have a second? Second garden here. Great. Let's go around. Andrew? Aye. David Kwan? Aye. Sunita? Aye. Howard? Yes. Ashwar? Aye. Dick? Yes. 
Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. And Chilanza, I vote aye. We're going for about three hours. Hey guys, it's about 11.35. Uh, let's take a five minute bio break and we'll reconvene at 11.40.
jump back in. Uh, Harvey, take take the stage, please. Thank you. I just wanted to add uh, one observation just for planning purposes under uh, our teleconference rules. As you know, and, uh, AB 361 has been very useful, but it only gives us latitude to, uh, uh, to meet for 30 days forward from the date we adopt it each time. Uh, the calendar this month is today's the 1st of December. So that authorization that the board just voted on is going to burn off on December 30th um, before our next uh, board meeting. Um, and so what that's going to mean is that uh, sometime before New Year's, uh, we're going to have to have a very fast uh, special meeting scheduled um, to uh, you know, re-up the AB 361 capability uh, for another 30 days after that to be able to extend into January. Just a heads up to everybody, I'll leave that up to Roberto and staff to coordinate um, with the board when we could have that uh, special teleconference meeting, but just to let you all know that uh, uh, otherwise December will come and go and we will be out of compliance and we'll be able to meet in January under, under those rules. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're welcome, RV. Once again, um, the geniuses that occupy our voted seats in Sacramento didn't bother to look at a calendar where you could have measured the difference between the first Thursday of every month in the calendar year, shoot the second Saturday, and notice that some of them are less than 30 days, and some of them are more than 30 days. And RV's smiling because you know what I'm saying. So we've had to do this a couple times with JPC. It's kind of stupid. You schedule monthly meetings, and they have to all be sort of less than monthly meetings since 30 days last September, for June, November, blah, 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 blah. All right, let's go ahead. And as usual, end of year, we've got a very large number uh, of folks uh, retiring, and we've got some real folks here climbing up on 30 years. So good for them. All right, let's go. Here we go. We got 21 of these, bear with me. Uh, Javier Acosta, police officer, police department, effective December 10th, 25.23 years service. Thomas M. Boyle, police lieutenant, police department, effective December 22nd, uh, 26.76 years service. Kevin L. Irby, fire captain, fire department, effective December 11th, 26.86 years service. Uh, Jonas J. Escalera, fire captain, fire department, effective December 11th, 28.13 years service with reciprocity. I'll keep going. Uh, oh, that's a great name. Brett uh, Gervasoni, probably town like me, battalion chief, wow, fire department, effective December 11th, 29.1 years service with reciprocity. Nabil Halt. Uh, Hi, Dar. Sorry, it's dark in this room. Police officer, police department, effective December 24th, 25.76 years service. John C. Hartman, police sergeant, police department, effective December 23, 26.3 years service. Min Lee, police officer, police department, effective December 23rd, 26.3 years service. Alex Lee, fire captain, fire department, effective December 11th, 25.36 years service. Eric J. Magnuson, Police Lieutenant, Police Department, effective December 11th, 28.16 years service with reciprocity. Mario, oh God, Mario, why'd you have to be a uh, Filipino? Uh, Mario, well, give me a second. <laughs> I should have read these four. Mario, oh, Pagali, you got I got it. Okay, fire, fire, fire Department, effective December, sorry about that, Mario, effective December 24th. 25 years service. Um, Scott um, Rosengana, fire department, uh, fire engineer, fire December 22nd with West Posse. Uh, Christopher J. Singleton, police sergeant, police department, effective December 23rd, 27.22 years service. Craig J. Storley, police lieutenant, police department, effective December 10, 26.73 years service. Uh, Glenn Thompson, fire prevention inspector, fire department. Um, effective December 11, 26.81 year service. Uh, Richard G. Tomlin Jr., police sergeant, police department effective December 23rd, 29.37 year service. Thanks. Thanks, Richard, for almost getting to 30. That's awesome. 
Uh, a back T Tran police officer, police department, effect December 11th with 30.0 in your service. Ring the bell for you right now, back. Um, Eric M. Ulrich, fire engineer, fire department, effect December 25th, 26.69. Your service with reciprocity. Uh, Michael L. Villanueva, police officer, police form, effective December 10th, uh, 25.5 year service. Um, William B. Wargo, fire engineer, fire department, effective December 25th. I love how half these are effective on Christmas Day. Uh, 21.1 year service. Uh, and finally, we have Brian Washington, Bryant, sorry, Bryant Washington, police officer, police form, Effective December 10, 27.18 years of service. Whew, that was a lot. Do I have a motion to approve these? So move, Santo. Great. Do I have a second? Second garden here. Uh, oh, interesting. We don't have any. any uh, anyway, uh, let's go around. Andrew. Aye. David Kwan. Aye. Zunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Eshvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. I'm Chair Lanza. I say aye as well. Any of you want to jump in and say anything about any of these good folks? Well, Santo is being a senior member here. I've known some of the officers and, of course, some of the firefighters, and we wish them nothing but the best and be safe and have a great retirement. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. This is Gardner. I just want to say uh, congratulations to all the men and women on this list, and uh, thank you for your service over all these years, and I hope you have a healthy retirement. Anything from yeah, you, Dave from, or Franco? Yeah, from Dave. Uh, I want to say I worked with most of the guys on the uh, PD side, and I can uh, attest that they're all good men, uh, and happy retirement. Enjoy life. Great. Um, we will, uh, and now announce, thank God we only have one death this time. Every now and then we have none. That was the best month. I know all the moment of silence. Uh, notification of death of Michael Moffat, firefighter, retired March 2nd, 2000, died October 13, 2022. Survivorship benefits to Patricia Moffat, spouse. Um, as I always do, I am now officially a senior citizen. My voice had not yet changed when this gentleman joined the force. We'll now have a moment of silence. Thanks. Any any words, Dick or Andrew? Yes, I uh, worked with Mike Moffat. He was one hell of a firefighter. Came over from the county and joined San Jose around 1976. You can see he was uh, with the widows and orphans, a real good union man. He was a very excellent firefighter, just a good person and. To his wife and all his family, we will miss Mike, and uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Dick. Um, we're, we are going to get you out of here by noon unless we manage to screw up somehow. Uh, let's go through the committees. Uh, investment Committee, Eshrar. Anything to report? Uh, nothing to report, uh, Drew. Thanks. Let's know we uh, received and filed minutes from uh, that. Special meeting on October 6th. Uh, audit risks. We need to anything to report out of audit risk? Nothing to report. Thanks. We receive and file again the October 6th special meeting minutes. Uh, governance. Uh, Franco, anything to report? Nothing to report. Great. We uh, again receive and file uh, the October 6th special minutes. Dick, anything to report from disability? No, everything is everything is fine. Uh, it looked like it was canceled, so um, we got nothing for December. Hey, thanks, Dick. Uh, let me note: uh, we also received and filed the October six special minutes uh, and joint personnel committee. I guess <laughs> is that I always forget. Andrew, is that you or Eshwar? I think as of now, Eshwar is still the vice chair, but I'll talk about it if you want me to. No, that's fine. Eshwar, anything to report from the JPC? No, I mean, Andrew, why didn't you go ahead? He's been reporting on the JPCs. <laughs> <laughs> there's not much to say. Uh, we're uh, continuing to work on um, uh, the CEO um, compensation survey, and we're also looking at the investment staff um, comp survey 
we will also be discussing the um, CEO and CIO uh, uh, review process uh, from last year. And that's about it. So those are the three main things that the board is addressing. And we have another meeting next week on December Ready. 8th, I believe. Andrew, uh, any final comments, public? Anybody want to jump in? Great. Everybody stay online. We're going to turn back over to Harvey uh, for the sub, the uh, committee uh, uh, thing. But let's go ahead and adjourn. Harvey, over back over to you, Harvey. Yeah, yeah.